welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. Thank you so very much for choosing to spend your Monday morning with us um, instead of facing the hundreds of emails that are waiting for you at the office and other business matters. Emails, USIP, hmm, it's not a hard choice. Um, but seriously, we know that it's really hard for you all to uh, get this time away from the office, especially half a day away from the office. So um, we are committed to making it a very productive, valuable time for you. Um, uh, we used to say around here, as my colleagues will tell you, we used to say that we wanted the time that you spent here to be at least as productive as the time you spend in your own offices. But then people pointed out to us that that really wasn't a very high bar to be setting. So uh, hold our feet to the fire. Um, you see any USIP staff around that could be helpful to making this a more valuable time, please don't hesitate to call on them. I'm Sheldon Himmelfarb, and I manage our Peace Tech Initiative uh, here at USIP, which works to bring both technology and media to bear on the problems of conflict management. And nowhere does this intersection of media and tech come into focus more sharply than in social media, whose impact on the trajectory of conflicts and political movements is being felt around the world. And that's why we started our Blogs and Bullets project here four years ago, to try and make sense of this brave new world, to understand how online social networks makes, um, uh, online social networks, bloggers, user-generated content, and more, how this is being used in conflict, and more importantly, how they can be harnessed for peace building. So with each year, the project has delved into the complexities of this question using a cross-discipline approach that combined state-of-the-art data analytics with expert social and political analysis. And you will get a good sense of both today, I think, as we unpack the analysis that our first panel has done of about 40 million tweets from the Syrian conflict. And again, that's a combined team from George Washington and AU that is as well versed in the technology in the online world as it is in Middle East politics and culture. And that, as I'm sure you know from the many meetings on this kind of topic around the, this town, is a very rare combination indeed. Each of the blogs and bullets reports has built on the previous one, which has created a nice record of the evolution in perception versus reality when it comes to the role of social media in violent international conflict. So what are some of the things? Let me just give you a sense of some of the things that we've learned across this series. In September 2010, when we released our first blogs and bullets uh, study, we identified a problem, a real problem in this field that was holding back our ability to understand the relationship between social media and social change, namely the increasingly entrenched positions of what we called in that report cyber optimists and cyber skeptics. And to get past the sweeping generalizations and the dueling anecdotes, that report laid out a five-level analytical framework for really helping us unpack the relationship between online and offline activity. So how are social media affecting individuals and their actions? How is it driving group action? How is it affecting intergroup action? How are regimes reacting to the activist use of these technologies? And finally, are social media helping to attract international attention? How is it affecting external actors? Um, uh, how, how are they affecting events on the ground? But that framework really was just the beginning of the story. As I said, the, the project has consistently tried to use large data sets and cutting edge analytics to answer these questions. As we all know, big data is a reality that has um, entered our vernacular thanks to the social media revolution. And our tools for making sense of this has really never, have never been better. So in our second report on new media and conflict after the Arab Spring, which we released in July of 2012, we followed our own advice, as it were. Not only did the report apply that five-level analytical framework to its study of social media's role in the Arab Spring, 
but it also drew on a unique data set to do that. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the, the bit.ly link shortening service. It takes your long URLs and it shortens them so they can fit into the 140 character limit of Twitter. Now, we recognize that data set is only a portion of online activity, um, but what was unique about it was that it enabled us to see not only who is making social media um, uh, during the Arab Spring, as most of the other analyses out there were focusing on, who's producing it, who's involved in that dialogue, but by focusing on the bit.ly links and who was um, using them, it allowed us to get a better sense of who's consuming the media um, in, that was um, being produced during the Arab Spring. Who is clicking through on these links, and what are they clicking through on, and why? And it led the research team to some really unexpected findings about social media in the Arab Spring that placed less emphasis upon it as an organizing tool, which we were hearing a lot of in the traditional media, and more emphasis upon it as a megaphone with which to engage the international community. So that's just a taste of some of the kind of counterintuitive findings that we came upon in the first two reports. And I'd urge anyone, we've got them all outside, along with the report that we're gonna talk about today. They're all on the table outside. Feel free to take them, and I'd urge you to take a look at those. So that brings us to today's meeting and the third report. And one of the important recommendations in that last report was that future research really needed to um, delve more deeply into specific conflicts within specific countries. And that's exactly what we are going to talk about today. On this first panel, you'll hear about the new report on Syria's socially mediated civil war from this talented GW AU team that I mentioned earlier. And then on the second panel, we'll go into the Middle East, uh, go outside the Middle East to places like Ukraine, which is on top of mind for everyone, and Turkey, where, as you know, digitally active protest movements are, again, working to shape the, their societies and their politics. So thank you all for joining today. I hope you'll lean in and really participate in the open, we've got mics on each side, in the open mic Q&A program, because I can assure you, your questions and comments will influence our research going forward. We've been doing this now for four years, and these meetings where we roll out the report based on the research the year before, and then invite your feedback on those findings are really Really important in helping us direct what are we going to be, what are we going to um, focus our energies on in the next research round? Is, should we be focusing towards certain geographic areas? Should we be thinking of other platforms? I mean, we've gone from using the Bitly data set to the Twitter data set. Um, what, what is top of mind for you? So it's very helpful to have these meetings, and your participation really does influence the research going forward. Um, and I should also say, we have a live webcast going on. Um, the event is streaming across the globe, so let me invite the online audience as well to interact with the panelists uh, and each other during the course of the event via Twitter using our hashtag for the day, which is hashtag USIP blogs. And when um, our moderator, PJ Crowley, goes to the audience during the Q&A session, he'll also have the option of going here to Anand Varghese, who will be um, able to talk about the discussion that's happening online and also relay your questions from the online audience to the panelists. So we want to know what uh, you're thinking, and we want you to know that you really are a core part of this event. So now let me introduce our, our moderator of the day, P.J. Crowley, a fellow at the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication within the School of Media and Public Affairs at GW University. Many of you know P.J. already as the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Public Affairs in 2009. And then, and this is what's really prepared him for today's role of artfully handing, handling questions of all types, um, he served as the spokesman at the Department of state from March 2011, where um, we thought of him as an extremely active Twitter diplomat. Uh, many of you know PJ appears frequently as commentator on various television networks, as a regular columnist for the Daily Beast, and we are very, very fortunate to have him with us today. So please give me a round of applause to welcome PJ.
I'm going to hand the podium over to PJ right now, but I would be remiss if I didn't also give a special thanks to our partners um, on this Blogs and Bullets series. As I said, it's been going on for four years, and they have really shaped this project through a combination of terrific expertise, but also great imagination. Um, the George Washington University and AU team here. Special thanks to Mark Lynch, Shauna Day, and Dean Freeland, who you'll hear from now. They have been super partners throughout the entire series, and on behalf of USIP, I really can't thank them enough either. Um, so with that, let me turn it to you, PJ. Uh, Sheldon, thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, joining us uh, here this morning. Uh, I was kind of uh, uh, there at the creation uh, as we tried to figure out uh, what social media were uh, and, and how to integrate uh, social media into our public diplomacy program and what impact it would have on the conduct of diplomacy. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, something that uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton embraced and, and you know, John Kerry both in his own voice and as Secretary of State uh, is an avid uh, you know, user of Twitter and, and, uh, and other social media and recognize it, it's, it's important. But we, we are, are still in the midst of a remarkable, uh, you know, not a five year beyond trend uh, in, uh, uh, in, in fu a fundamentally transforming, yet again, environment in terms of the use of technology, the information environment, and the impact that that is having on uh, you know, various uh, uh, transformative events uh, throughout the world. Um, we, we saw the introduction in 2009 of, of Twitter as an element, large or small, uh, in events in, in Iran. Obviously, uh, we have been studying uh, it, its impact uh, throughout the you know, so-called Arab Spring or uh, Arab uprisings. Uh, and, and even try to assess uh, what has happened most recently in the uh, dynamics in, in Turkey and uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so we have an extraordinary panel. My job is to largely get out of the way, but we, we're still trying to figure out, you know, what does this mean? Uh, social media in and of itself uh, integrated uh, in, in a symbiotic relationship uh, with uh, traditional media. Uh, how populations are reacting to this tool, how governments are reacting to this tool. But first and foremost, as Sheldon said you know, quite well, have to try to sort out perception of reality. What, what, you know, what is actually happening, what's the dynamic, and what are the implications both in the immediate term uh, and the long term. So um, we have an extraordinary group here that has been uh, responsible for uh, this report. Uh, and we're going to begin our conversation with uh, Dean Freelon, Assistant Se Professor. Of, I'm, I'm sorry. We're going to begin our conversation with Sean Abe, you know, Director of the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. Thanks, PJ. Um, first of all, on behalf of Mark and Dean, I want to uh, thank Sheldon and USIP for what's been a really wonderful partnership over the years. Um, this has been a fascinating project, and we've had a number of collaborators over the years, uh, including uh, Mark and mine's colleagues, John Sides and Henry Farrell, uh, Ethan Zuckerman, and uh, John Kelly from Berkman, uh, and a number of others who've worked in one capacity or another with us or participated in workshops that USIP and GW have hosted. Um, and it's just been a great uh, time to be studying this. If you think about when we first, uh, our first report, uh, four or five years ago was about the Green Revolution in 2009 in Iran. And since then, uh, not only uh, have new media changed, but the role of new media, their uses by protesters, by regimes, the intersection of new media and traditional media, all of these things have evolved so much that um, it's been a great time to be in the field because we are constantly updating what it is that we think we know and what we know we don't know anymore. Uh, and that's been really exciting. How people, protesters, regimes, et cetera, use the same media over the course of this time, whether it's Twitter or <coughs> Facebook or traditional media, has changed and is changing. And I think one of the things that our reports have always tried to do is say, um, we aren't giving a definitive answer that will hold forever. What we're trying to do is say what it looks like now and where it might go. 
Uh, and I think this report, more than ever, maybe uh, uh, takes that spirit uh, at hand because what we saw with this report, because we looked at over a long period of time, Gene will be talking more about the specifics of the data in a minute, but we saw how um, YouTube videos, for instance, the use of them by protesters and activists and opposition forces and by the regime and by traditional media changed as the nature of the conflict changed, as the nature of YouTube uh, itself changed, as Twitter changed. We saw changes in, in the uses and effects of all of these different media and the intersection uh, there. And, and uh, that's been really fascinating. And as we look forward in our, in our uh, research program, uh, it's a really exciting time to start going back and re-looking at some of the things we looked at before. Um, Sheldon mentioned the Arab Spring. We did a report on that a year ago. Um, but the Arab Spring is obviously a very different story now than it was in 2011. And uh, it's a very exciting time as researchers to go back and look at what went wrong, what's gone right, and what that role of media has been. It was a very heady time, if you remember, uh, when people were very excited about the role of, uh, the potential role of social media in particular in helping foment and uh, peaceful revolution. And yet, obviously, things are very different now. But one thing that remains the same and presumably always will is that media, new or old, digital or terrestrial, whatever kind of media we're talking about, is still the primary lens by which outside publics witness a country's internal struggles, and also increasingly how people inside a country share information with each other, see things that in, in the past they wouldn't have been able to see, whether that's regime abuses or really great empowering examples of other people standing up uh, to those abuses. Um, but we're also seeing other things. Uh, we're also seeing ways in which, and this will be, I think, part of the story of the second panel as well, we're also seeing ways in which social media in particular, because of, in part just because of its ubiquity, its ability to get around firewalls, its, uh, and its use in traditional media, uh, is also a way in which protesters in one country are able to learn from protesters in another country. We tend to frame that discussion in, in terms of a positive. Oh, they're learning how to protest. They're, they're becoming empowered. This was part of the story in early 2011 uh, that we looked at in our report was a claim that there was sort of a domino of protests that happened from Tunisia to, to Egypt and on. Uh, we didn't find a lot of evidence of, of that per se, but um, it's worth pointing out that there's at least some evidence coming out over the last few months, uh, especially the last month, that protesters also learn other things. They learn not only nonviolent means, but they learn some ways to have violent protest, how to uh, uh, create a proper Molotov cocktail, for instance, is something that we've read about over the last few weeks. So there are a variety of ways in which the story is far more complex than sometimes we like to uh, discuss uh, or admit, and far more complex than we see in the mainstream media. One of the things that uh, is interesting about the Syria case that we report on here um, is that we saw a dramatic change during the time period that we looked at in traditional media, mainstream media's access inside Syria. So as researchers, it's interesting because it's like a quasi-experiment, right? So we're able to see a period in which mainstream media journalists were by and large, not able to get inside the country. There were some that did, there were some who died doing so. Uh, but generally speaking, they didn't have the kind of access that they did in, say, uh, even the Iraq War, or some other traditional uh, environment, or in the other instances of the Arab Spring. Later, they gained access, but it was a limited access, usually under escort from certain opposition groups, to battlefields, uh, or areas of conflict. What we were able to see in our data is how that changed the story in traditional media, but also how it changed the interaction between traditional media and online media. For instance, uh, one of the things we found was that when traditional media were outside, they were much more reliant on 
on the kinds of citizen journalism, opposition created journalism uh, online uh, than they were later when they could use their own eyes uh, to do their reporting. Obviously, reporters prefer to be able to report on what they see. It makes it, makes it seem more real to them. Issues of verification seem easier. But there are other ways in which this is a kind of bias. It's a kind of bias that really fits with certain news norms that we see in other uh, other routine, uh, other sorts of situations, other wars, conflicts, etc. In the Syria case, it was interesting because when journalists didn't have access, that really empowered activists and citizen journalists and opposition groups to get their information out. But it placed um, it placed a premium on the traditional journalists in establishing legitimacy and veracity of those online videos, let's say, which is very difficult to do when you're not there. How do you know what the legitimate group is, right? On the other hand, you because you weren't in a town where you could see with your own eyes what was happening and you had the bias of reporting on what you could see, in some ways, the story was broader because you were seeing a broader field, let's say, right? The battle space was bigger, but so was the protest space. You saw a lot more nonviolent protests. There were more of those sorts of stories, in part because that was the nature of the conflict early. There was more of that, but also in part because journalists weren't only seeing conflict. When journalists gained access, it was typically, A, at a stage in the conflict where there was just more conflict, but also it was typically under escort, we would, in the Iraq case, would have said embedded in a way, uh, and in some ways it resembles uh, the embedding story in terms of the nature of the coverage, but it was a, a more limited view. We see evidence, it, when that happens, of journalists um, uh, doing less to check the credibility of the sources that they're using, the online sources, et cetera. We also see them reporting on the narr narrowly on what they see as opposed to what is out there, right? So the story doesn't necessarily change in terms of what's actually happening in Syria. What changes is what reporters report on. And that's not, that's not necessarily a lie. It's not a lie. It's not necessarily wrong. But it is something that's different. That's not exactly explained by events, right? Uh, one of the stories we heard at a year ago or earlier when we had a, our last big conference here at USIP was um, Deb Amos of NPR pointing out that when journalists gained access inside the country, they stopped reporting on certain cities where there was a lot of conflict. Um, and, uh, and that's not because the conflict stopped, it's because they weren't looking at it anymore. Now how they looked at it before was virtually. But now that they could look at things with their own eyes, that changed. At a later workshop that we had at Stanford uh, as part of this project, um, Ivan Siegel from, uh, from Global Voices pointed out that there was still a large protest, nonviolent protest movement going on in Syria when most of the reporting was all about conflict and fighting. And so it's a different story, and it changes the intersection and the way we understand the blending of new media and old media. And one of the things that we found over the course of the time of this research project is just that, that those, tr those boundaries in between old and new media don't exist the way they did even just four or five years ago. And understanding that intersection, whether it's the way Al Jazeera integrated social media during the Tahrir Square protests in 2011, or what we saw during our Syria uh, study, uh, that's an important part of the story as well. Um, I want to turn it to Dean to talk about uh, the research side, sort of the data, and um, and how that went, and then to and then to Mark. Uh, certainly, um, I need to come up here to the podium so that I can advance the slides here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the highlights of our report. You can read the full data analysis in the report itself. So first, um, you know, uh, I want to say that we bought our data uh, from a Twitter uh, authorized vendor, um, which was able to provide us with complete data for the following search queries, which was we looked for the term Syria, its equivalent in Arabic between January 1st, 2011 and April 30th, 2013. Uh, we later after the report extended that uh, data frame, um, time frame until the end of August, as you'll see uh, on the next slide. But that's what we got. It's complete data for those particular terms, which uh, lifted up above some Twitter analyses that uh, only use um, <clears throat> publicly available uh, APIs, which 
uh, limit the amount of data that you can uh, pull out from Twitter. And we also got full metadata for that, which means that we, uh, we captured information such as the tweet's author, uh, its date and time, the application that was used to post the tweet, as well as the predominant language that was uh, used in the tweet. <clears throat> okay. So what you're looking at here is a chart of the uh, percentages of English and Arabic tweets over time uh, with English in red and Arabic in blue. And you can see early on, if you look at the left, that uh, English dominates the Syria conversation until about June 2011, where they reach uh, rough parity, after which uh, Arabic dominates to the tune of above 60% um, all the way through until uh, August um, 2013, where uh, where it reaches just about parity again. That's when uh, Obama was considering a, a military strike against Syria during that month. Um, <clears throat> and so the point I think that this graph shows is that uh, the, the Arab Spring narrative that uh, Twitter was mostly used by far-flung English-speaking users rather than Arabic-speaking users who are physically and emotionally closer to the action uh, evaporated almost uh, immediately after the initial events of the of the Arab Spring. So, so things right after we uh, published the results of the uh, Blogs and Bullets 2 report, the situation on the, on the ground, as it were, changed. Um, and, uh, and only uh, a major news event, like Obama's consideration of a military strike on Syria, could, uh, was sufficient to change that uh, ratio to a significant degree. Okay, so this next chart uh, is a chart of um, the number of tweets in English and Arabic over time, and it clearly shows that the event-driven nature of communication activity uh, about Syria on Twitter. Uh, notice the difference between the events that create spikes in Arabic language and uh, English language tweets. Uh, they both spike when events, uh, circumstances involve the, U the U.S. Uh, but the latter, um, that is, um, oops, my goodness, come back, oh, there we are. Uh, but uh, the Arabic language tweets um, spike uh, where major events occur on the ground that don't necessarily involve the U.S. So near the beginning of the duration, we see double spikes in both English and Arabic when Obama calls on Assad to step down, and uh, in February 2012 when the U.S. shuts down its uh, Syrian uh, uh, embassy. Um, and there are also uh, spikes in both English and Arabic toward the end uh, for two events involving uh, Assad's use of uh, chemical weapons. Um, but if you take a look at the, the two um, uh, uh, massacres um, in, in the middle, in May 2012 and in July 2012, you see major spikes in Arabic, but not in uh, English, uh, indicating that um, uh, those events are closer to the uh, emotions as well as also, you know, the, the physical locations of the individuals who are tweeting about that uh, in Arabic as opposed to the English language. Um, so in addition to this language analysis, we also uh, clustered Twitter users based on who they retweeted. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a group of network clusters from March 2013. So this is just an example uh, which shows which uh, groups of individuals attracted the most attention during that month. Um, English-speaking journalists lead the pink cluster at the top. Uh, the colors and the positioning of this are arbitrary, but the distances do represent the degree of separation between these clusters. Uh, so that's the English journalist cluster at the top, uh, while the other clusters, all of which predominantly speak Arabic, uh, are much closer to one another. Um, <clears throat> you'll note also that uh, only one of these Arabic-speaking clusters is pro-Assad, um, <clears throat> and that the others support one or more factions uh, among the, uh, the opposition there. Okay, last slide. Uh, so let's take a look at how these clusters changed in terms of how open they were to outside information. So what you're looking at here is uh, a chart in which the lower the line on the lower the lines on these chart drops, the more cluster members retweet only one another as opposed to uh, others outside of their cluster. So uh, the major finding here is if you look toward the bottom, the blue line that slopes down, um, that's the English journalist cluster going increasingly isolated over time. Um, but you'll see that uh, among the Arabic language clusters, there's a lot of variation. Um, so uh, the al Wasal cluster, which is uh, um, based in Saudi Arabia, kind of goes up and down, as does the one for the Syrian opposition. Uh, Kuwait actually is fair, uh, stays fairly even, um, right between uh, 0.2 and point, negative 0.2 and negative uh, 0.4. Um, 
Al Jazeera has a little bit of a decline. Um, and if you look at Pro Assad down there at the lower right, it sort of starts low uh, in uh, September 2012 and stays uh, fairly low in terms of being very isolated and insular. Um, now, these uh, patterns are almost certainly a consequence of both language and ideology, and we're currently digging deeper into the data to discover um, what else might play a role in determining how uh, the parties to this conversation uh, direct their attention. So uh, I'll hand it over to Mark. All right. Is this, is this on? Can you hear me? Great. Okay. So first off, I want to, um, uh, to really uh, give a shout out to, to Dean Freeland, who's been uh, the backbone of a lot of this research. And I think, it's, it's, I think one of the things that we've learned as we've gone on with this is that basically to do the kind of research which I think really needs to be done, you need to have partnerships now. You need to people, have people with unique skill set. Um, Dean able to do the, hard, the hardcore data analysis, um, people who speak Arabic or the local languages, people who understand the, uh, you know, the linkages and, and the, the media communication side. I think that uh, in the past, I've always been more of a lone wolf on research, and it, you can't do it anymore. Uh, and I think that this has been, uh, I've, I've learned an enormous amount from working with Dean over the last uh, six months. What he presented is uh, what was in the Blogs and Bullets report. What he didn't tell you is that this is based primarily, and uh, we did a, a kind of an early snapshot slices of six month intervals. Um, now we're doing the full data set, uh, all 32 months, and uh, we're also going a lot deeper. Um, and so the qualitative analysis that you saw, the hints up there was based on my qualitative coding of 200, the top 250 most retweeted tweets. Um, so now he's gone from the top five clusters to the top 10 clusters, and all kinds of fascinating new information comes out. And I've gone from the top 250 tweets to the top 5,000 tweets, and um, and uh, we've learned an enormous amount. If you by looking at the top 5,000 most retweeted tweets, um, that captures a about uh, just over 10 million tweets out of the, the 30 million, uh, roughly, uh, uh, um, that are relevant. And um, so that's what a lot of this is based on. I just want to bring out, there's a lot of things that we could talk about, and, and I think that some of the things that Sean and Dean have, have mentioned uh, are, are at the core of it. Um, I want to uh, focus on just a couple of the what I see as the key takeaways from this deeper analysis, a little going beyond the initial report. You read the report, there's a lot of important stuff in there. We've gone up beyond it a little bit. On the isolation of English journalists, I mean, I think this is a very interesting and important finding, of course, that the vast majority of what we, we being the collective uh, American policy community, look at is uh, you know the, the, the discussion among a relatively small group of English language journalists and analysts and, um, the, and then English speaking Arab uh, kind of bridges who then translate the um, the, uh, the discussion on the ground or the discussion in the broader Arabic speaking community out for that audience. And I think that one of the important points to flag from Sean is that there's absolutely no reason to assume that this is an innocent or a non-biased uh, bridging function, that people bridge because they want to accomplish something. If you were a Syrian activist and you were trying to build support for international intervention in Syria or the funding of the Free Syrian Army, of course you were going to highlight the peaceful pro-American nature of the Free Syrian Army and downplay sectarian uh, acts. Um, why wouldn't you? I mean, this, this should be built in to, uh, to people's expectations. One finding, when we first presented the finding about the increasing isolation and marginality of the English-speaking uh, uh, Twitter community, people's, I, I think a lot of people came back at us with the comment that, wow, the, the English speakers are really, you know, they're, they're really unimportant, that we shouldn't even be paying attention to them. And that was entirely wrong, because of course, they are within the English speaking community, they are setting the agenda, they are reporting things, they are helping to determine what information filters from the online stuff into mainstream media. The one, I think one of the key findings here is the enormous power which you have if you are one of the privileged bridges between clusters. And that doesn't only go for the Arabic into the English, it also goes between the, cluster, the Arabic speaking clusters. Um, the research that we're doing now, we're trying to identify specific individuals, specific accounts that have a disproportionate impact on the understandings going across these increasingly insular and increasingly clustered um, dialogue communities. Um, and now, 
one of the things that this allows you to do to the extent that you have highly insular, insular clusters is you would think that it allows you to, to narrow cast, as they say. In other words, one message to one community, a different message to another community. Um, and so, for example, maybe you want to be able to show your English-speaking potential backers in the West that you are a civic, nonviolent, uh, democratic movement, but you want to signal to your, um, your potential financial backers in the Gulf that you are you know, a good sectarian Islamist willing to go out there and fight for the, uh, the, 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 the Sunni uh, community. As long as those clusters are completely insular, you can do that. And you can send one message here, one message there. But as soon as people start noticing things across those clusters, your messaging starts to break down. And I actually think that's one of the big things that happened um, over the course of the last year, is that the pressure on uh, actors who are involved with the Syrian opposition were increasingly focused upon attracting um, financial resources and political support from the Gulf, they needed to highlight their military effectiveness and their ideological purity in order to attract funding from the Gulf. The more that they did that, the more resources flowed in, but the more it complicated their messaging to the West and their messaging to the international community. And I think that, contra in, in a sense, you might think that, they, that as we see this increasing clustering, they would be more, they would be able to maintain this, but in fact, I don't think they would. You, might, you all might remember the uh, the famous uh, thing we reported in FP, and it was everywhere. The the, the heart eating commander, actually, it was a lung eating commander, showing that wow, we thought these rebels were kind of freedom fighters, and look, this guy's crazy. He's out there eating the hearts and lungs of his opponents. I think this is a classic example of the breakdown of narrow casting, something which was created for one community and was effective in demonstrating both military effectiveness and ideological uh, purity, but when translated over into another discourse community looks insane and really undermines the broader perception and broader um, beliefs about what the, about the nature of the opposition. So that's one of the big things that, that we found. One other thing is that we here in Washington especially, we, we, we think that the United States is really important, right? We think that American policy is the single most important thing about Syria and what Obama does is what everybody wants to know about. You might be interested to know that with the exception of August 2013, when, um, when we actually Actually, um, we're talking about that military intervention and everyone in the United States started paying attention again. If you take that out, um, the 93% uh, the of all references to Obama are in English. 93%. The Arabic-speaking community does not care about Obama, uh, for the most part. They don't think American policy is all that important. They're focused on other things. Um, and this includes during the election months, where the, you know, to the extent that Syria emerges in the English-speaking Twitter community, uh, it, it's about you know, the election and Romney and Obama and debates and stuff like that, doesn't even merit. There's actually one of the months, I think it's, I think it's October of 2012, just before the election, Guess the number of Arabic language references to Obama that appear in the top 5,000 most retweeted tweets? Zero. That tells you the gap between the way people in Washington are talking about this and the way people in the Arab world are talking about it. Okay, just a few more things before PJ throws me off the stage. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we find, which I think is, we've documented this, I think, in a way that no one else has documented it before, is that there really was an early, early on, an Arab Spring frame. There was something very real about it, and we can track its degradation and its disappearance. Early on, in those first, about roughly the first six months or so, up through about July, roughly, of 2011, um, there were very clear uh, clusters of, uh, of, of Twitter discourse that linked together different issues in different different communities. There was an Al Jazeera cluster which linked together Egyptian activists, Tunisian activists, yet all activists from all over the place, which actually had a positive insularity, which is really hard to do. That means you're actually having more um, connections outside of your own community than inside your own community. Uh, Dean's going to tell me I'm wrong about my... No, 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 that's okay. that's basically, right? <laughs> but, but basically, it's hard to do, but it tells that this was a very non-insular kind of discussion. There was an Egyptian activist cluster that was talking a lot about Syria. The main Syrian cluster, uh, opposition-linked um, uh, Syrian opposition, um, 
had names like Revolution Syria and Syrian Jasmine was a really big account back then, explicitly linking Syria to the Tunisian uh, revolution. Um, and there was an Arab Spring cluster of English uh, uh, translators. Sultan al-Qasimi, Andy Carvin, Blake Hounshell were really key on that. They shared content with all the other clusters. We can show this all statistically. By about the fall of 2011, they all disappeared completely. Completely. Al Jazeera goes from a positive insularity to becoming one of the most insular communities by about the, what, the fall of 2012, roughly. Uh, its insularity goes like this all the way down. It crashes completely. The Egyptian activists stop talking about Syria, probably because they have other things on their minds by that point, um, they, you know, with their own revolution falling apart. Um, the uh, the, the um, Syrian cl opposition cluster fragments, just like it does in real life, into a free Syrian army cluster, a Salafi cluster, um, a whole bunch of different things. So there's an early Arab Spring frame that was really powerful. You can really see it clearly, and then it disappears. And then it goes in different directions. What it turns into is really interesting. And this is kind of the research that I've been doing uh, recently that we haven't published yet, but we will soon. In the West, uh, in, in kind of the English-speaking community, it's largely replaced by what I would call an R2P frame, responsibility to protect frame, focused on the question of, whether, of intervention, of Western intervention, with lots and lots of efforts to try and highlight atrocities in this kind of regime, killing innocent people, pushing for no-fly zones, pushing for activ you know, various kinds of hashtag activism, showing pictures of dead children, hashtags, help for Syria, you know, things like that. And I think that this actually had a, a counterproductive effect in the sense that the more that people talked about intervention in the United States, the more this triggers an Iraq frame rather than an Arab Spring frame. The minute you say the word Iraq, Americans run screaming. And you see the public opinion uh, polling goes along with that. And again, I don't think that the, 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 the online stuff directly is the only thing explaining things happening in public opinion or on the ground. But I think it's pretty clear um, that the more that you talk about Arab Spring, the more you saw an interest by Americans to get involved. The more you had this Iraq framing, um, the uh, the more you the, the, the more you didn't. And um, I, I think that that's something which really, the more the more intervention talk, the less American support you had. You also had these credibility issues that Sean was talking about. As people began to see things which didn't fit the frame, uh, the more they kind of lost. I think, confidence in the information they were seeing. And so I think in the West, I think the Syrian opposition, um, I wouldn't say that they lost the, uh, the the media war or the framing war, but I think that the shift to an intervention frame hurt them badly with key audiences, um, as, at least outside the Beltway. On the other hand, in the Gulf, it went in the entirely opposite direction. In these Gulf, um, the, the, the Arabic language Gulf clusters that we're talking about, the focus was not upon trying to pressure governments to intervene. It was on trying to get individuals to become more actively involved in specific things that they could do to support the Syrian people and Syrian opposition factions. Fundraising appeals, calls to demonstrate outside of the Syrian embassy, calls to boycott a local Syrian business, calls to retweet a particular um, image or a particular sermon. There was a lot of imagery and rhetoric and discourse um, which was not just religious in focus, but, in, but intended to trigger uh, identity and this sense of, of I, not only that my people are being killed, but I can do something concrete to help them. And this is something which is just fascinating to watch as it goes along. By far, in the middle period after that fall 2011, by far the most frequently retweeted and most influential accounts are these Kuwaiti Islamists, people like Nabil Al-Awadi, uh, Hajjaj al uh, uh, um, uh, th those are two that really jump out. There's a bunch of others. But these guys are out there retweeting saying, you know, I'm going to be outside this mosque on Friday, come by and bring clothes text money to this bank account, you know, things like that. They were specific things linked to a 
common communal appeal. And it was extremely effective. Now, the effects on the ground were, lar were often that it tended to promote fragmentation among different rebel groups because they're competing with each other for access to these outside resources. Uh, I think it helped to drive sectarianism because these appeals often took an anti-Iran and anti-Shia tone, very different from what we saw in the English language discourse. Um, far more sectarian language, far more appeals to jihad, to anti-Shia uh, rhetoric and the like. And you know, we can see this very clearly emerging. Um, the last point I want to make, and then I, I really will stop, is I didn't have time to turn this into a slide because this is active stuff we're doing. But I, I broke this down into three, three basic phases, an Arab Spring phase, April 2011 to November 2011, a, a kind of a mixed phase, December 2011 to July 2012, and then the uh, full insurgency phase of July 2012 to July 2013. I left out the August 2013 month because it's so skewed by the debate about American intervention that it's, it, it swamps things and it's not useful. Um, and this is, I think this is really interesting. In that first period, this, this is the analysis of the top 5,000 most retweeted tweets um, um, uh, for, on a monthly basis. In the Arab Spring phase, um, Obama has mentioned a reasonable 328 times, 328 tweets with, with the term Obama in English or Arabic. Um, jihad is mentioned only 38 times out of 145,000 potential observations. Jihad is only mentioned 38 times. Iran, 11,143. Um, calls for donations, uh, 85, you know, very little. And regime, which is a proxy for Syrian opposition activism, basically attacking the Syrian uh, regime, um, was by far twice, as more, uh, over 2,000 uh, individual tweets were retweeted, by far the most. That's the Arab Spring phase. You go from the second phase, and Obama basically disappears. Nobody talks about Obama almost at all between uh, December, uh, 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 December 2011 and July 2012. Jihad jumps up to 287, which is something, but not a huge amount. Iran stays constant. Regime drops in half. Down down to 1,400 as kind of straightforward anti-regime uh, activism goes down. And calls for donations jumps up to over 1,500. It's, by, it's the single most retweeted phrase, um, keyword that I searched in that middle period, calls for donations. Finally, you get to the full-on insurgency phase, and Iran jumped triples in mentions, all the way up to over 3,000 mentions. Jihad spikes up to over uh, 1,270 references and um, regime stays constant, um, donation cuts in half down to 722. In other words, by tracking this qualitatively um, and, and, and doing it like this, you can actually see the trends that we're all talking about. Um, I wish I had made a slide, but I'm not that organized. Um, the last point I want to make, just to link this for this panel to the next panel, is the inspiration for doing this actually came from Zainab, who's sitting um, in the second row, who basically came back at us and said, this is wonderful quantitative analysis, but you're not really capturing what people are doing with retweets or what they're actually saying to each other. So now we're, we're trying to answer Zainab's critique, and so we'll see if we succeed later. OK, PJ. Wow. Uh, a, a lot to chew on there. Let me ask the panel kind of a combination of, of two or three different questions, perhaps each of you can take. Um, you know, one, is there is there anything fundamentally new about this? If you think about uh, Robert Edmonds, you know, cascade model, uh, where, where you you have this dynamic between policymakers and elites that that drive you know policy formulation and public opinion as it relates to policy formulation. So are these bridgers just the, a, a a new form of of so social elites that will play a role in the future? Um, secondly, you know, Sean, you mentioned uh, Ethan Zuckerman of uh, MIT and, and his fine book, Rewire. And, and, and you know, Ethan talks about the potential that social media have for this kind of global conversation. But when it breaks down into your, into your you know, self-selecting clusters, what do these slides represent? You know, it, it, is it a global conversation with threads that cut across that, that ink splot there? Or, 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 you know, or, or is it just a, a combination of isolated conversations with, with very little in the way of, of, of overlap? Um, I'll take the first part of that since uh, Bob's actually a colleague of mine at SMPA, of ours at SMPA uh, at GW. 
Um, and I've talked about this with him a lot, so I can give you the, the Annie Hall answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that would be if he's here. Yeah, that's right. right, right, right. Um, right. Um, I will misrepresent him since he's not here. He can't. Uh, no. So uh, one of the things that uh, I know that Bob is very interested in doing, since he came out with this cascade model, which some of you may or may not be aware of, but which PJ accurately um, distilled the, right there, uh, is how to integrate outside, particularly outside the U.S., international sources, non-state actors, et cetera. Uh, and so what we're doing, I think, is showing one of actually several different ways in which the model can be expanded to include pressures. Basically what the model's trying to do is explain this, the cascade is basically from foreign policy elites down to publics um, and the various pressures and feedback loops that help explain how certain issues get on the, the policy and news agenda and, and public agenda and how they stay there, why they do, why they don't, and this constant reframing of, of issues and who has the power. And generally speaking, what we find in various kinds of research is that foreign policy elites, especially the White House and the United States context, uh, have all of that power. Uh, but what Bob shows is the various ways in which pressures are put on them. What we're doing is, I think, adding to it in a couple of ways, uh, at least. I'll just focus on a couple real quick. One is the way in which um, international non-state actors and other groups influence the foreign policy decision making and framing of foreign policy issues in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so that's one. Two, a cross-cultural approach. We're able to show, I think, with these data, especially what Mark was just getting at, um, the ways in which how other how how the United States might be talking about something or conceiving of it or framing a, a conflict or, or a crisis is completely different, if not totally alien, from the way uh, others are in ways that are really, really relevant for understanding how this policy is going to play out, including the foreign policy choices uh, and options of the United States. And third, uh, finally, understanding that um, you know, a key part of any mass communication model about foreign policy making and its relationship to media and public opinion involves media. And what we're showing, uh, most of that research, of course, is in the, in the US context. And what we're showing is that in a lot of very important ways, the English language media, the Western media, um, was divorced from at least our reality that was particularly salient within the country of Syria, within the region, within the major players in the area, uh, in ways that really make you question, so what version of this is true, and also what's the influence of this on policy making? Mark mentioned R2P. R2P is one of the more important aspects of foreign policy making, particularly in this administration. Well. A lot of that, at least in theory, is going to depend not only on what the administration knows, which is more than media, but also on, in theory at least, uh, public preferences. Well, the public preferences are probably dictated to almost an entire degree by what they're seeing in media. What, how else do ordinary Americans learn about what's happening in Syria? But what they're learning about in Syria is completely different, maybe even than what's actually happening in Syria. And I think that's a real contribution for helping us understand this foreign policy process. Uh, I can take the question about what do these clusters represent. So the clusters are based on retweets, and unlike a lot of other research on uh, Twitter, um, the uh, implications that we draw from these clusters are not dependent upon assuming that retweets mean anything in particular. So a lot of research will say, okay, well, we're going to assume that retweets mean endorsements or that retweets mean authority or what have you. We assume only that, uh, you know, um, we look only at what a retweet actually is, so a definition of a retweet. So what does a retweet do? It redistributes information from one source to another. And so we consider that a retweet is a social signal that um, reveals how a group of people are directing their attention. And so uh, in Twitter, the way that retweets typically work um, and the way that the clusters in this uh, research uh, operate is that they are very long-tailed. So in other words, you've got a, a large number of people who are, uh, in other words, the leaders of the cluster, right? So, you know, a lot of the leaders of the English journalist cluster, and Mark can speak with some of the leaders of some of the Arabic clusters, are uh, very famous journalists. They're um, the official accounts of um, outlets like Reuters and the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and everything else. And so these leaders kind of constitute uh, you know, a group of people who are uh, sort of in the long tail and uh, retweeting them. And so 
the clusters themselves uh, represent what we call, I mean, this kind of technical term, uh, Mark actually mentioned something very similar uh, when he was talking, this idea of discourse communities. Right? So if you think of something like, uh, a good example of this would be, you know, for Fox News, you know, the Fox News Nation, or for the Colbert Report, the Colbert, Report, or the Colbert Nation. It's a group of people who are all paying attention to a very small number of individuals who can be uh, labeled in an intuitive way. So English journalists, you know, um, uh, 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 Kuwaiti uh, um, Preachers of religious uh, figures, the Syrian opposition, all of the leaders of the, of the, or the vast majority of the leaders in these clusters fit under this umbrella. And so over time, we can see how the, the, the leaders of these clusters, uh, how the attention of their followers um, are distributed and the extent to which um, you know, the, the retweets in these clusters are mostly within the clusters, mostly uh, within that sort of discourse or epistemic community is another term that we use, um, and to the extent to which the lines of retweeting and the lines of communication by extension um, extend to other clusters. And critically, and this is something we didn't talk about in the talk, whether the clusters um, that are connected are primarily clusters that are allied or clusters that cross linguistic lines or clusters perhaps, you know, maybe there's some sniping between clusters that, are, that, that, that oppose one another. So, so that's just a little bit about what these, what these uh, clusters actually do represent. Dean, Dean has also calculated something called the IO ratio, which yeah. is just too complicated to even talk about. But, they, but, but basically what it's trying to get at is how much information is shared across clusters, exactly your question, and which clusters tend to share information with each other. One thing which we have not been able to deal with, and this again gets back to Zainab Tefechki, who will be speaking later, is the subtweeting phenomenon. You know, when people are like saying things without directly linking or retweeting them, and so there might actually be a dialogue going on. Jay, you're probably talking talk about that when you're talking about Turkey, but there's like a dialogue going on we might not be able to capture, and so that's some, one of the things that the social dynamics of retweeting that we haven't really solved for yet. Uh, actually, uh, one more thing about retweeting. It's really important to understand that within each cluster, there's information that goes out of each cluster and information that comes into each cluster. So one thing that you tend to see with the English journalist cluster, especially uh, in the beginning during the Arab Spring phase, is that the English journalist cluster is the source of a lot of information that people that other clusters take from them. So in other words, other clusters are heavily retweeting them, but the cluster itself is not heavily retweeting those other clusters. So you have different clusters that serve these different roles. Some provide primarily information to other clusters. Others are aggregators of information that come from other uh, clusters. And so that's another thing to, to keep in mind. So I'll ask one more question and we'll open it up. But in the, uh, the, the headline of your report, Syria has been the most socially mediated civil conflict in history. Um, is, is this an, another form of curation, in, in, in a sense? Uh, or are, are these uh, individuals that can move, bridge across clusters, are, are they the new Walter Lippmann's or Henry Luce's, you know, who, who have obviously, in the context of traditional media, always been able to shape and influence uh, public opinion in, in one direction or another in the context of war or protest. I can't speak for Dean and Sean, but my take on the socially mediated nature of Syria's war is that this is an environmental rather than a straight causal kind of argument, where basically it's like this is something which makes Syria different from anything which has happened before that you have just so much information being recorded on camera phones and uploaded and social networks being connected and information being shared. I think it matters in all kinds of ways that are often unpredictable, and these are genuine network effects. Um, and so what you're describing might be one of the effects, but I'm not sure that it's even the most important of them, because really, if you go back to like, uh, you know, Iraq in 1991 during that war, and think about like the information blackout, blackouts the coalition was able to make, sustain. Think about how the Saudis were able to prevent their own citizens from even knowing that the invasion had happened. Go back to like Iraq in like the mid 2000s, you see kind of a proto type for what we're seeing now, um, but it was still much, much less than we, than we have now. Now it's like full blown. I think all future conflicts are gonna look like this. Yep. And so basically you look at Syria, you say environmentally, this is what civil wars are gonna look like in the future. And so then you try and figure out what are the various uh, effects that that might have. Or they're gonna look more like this and what it blossoms into than like the old model. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how, how should we work the microphones? Yeah, um, should we have people line up at the microphones or someone yeah, or bringing them around? Step, or? Up, step up to the microphone. Mm -hmm. 
spy out the camera on you. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Faribo Parsa, George Mason University. Um, could you tell uh, us who are dominating groups uh, using social media? Did you, uh, did, did you make any research on about gender and political opinion? My interest, I'm working at George Mason, is uh, women's activism on social media, and women are very significant because in uh, Middle Eastern countries, women are excluded from po uh, political uh, decision making. So their activities on media is so important. So did you have any um, research of, based on gender or political opinion? Thank you. Uh, I can speak a little bit into that. Uh, gender is, tough, is a tough uh, nut to crack. You know, we, uh, in some um, in some earlier research in blogs and bullets too, we were, we had some very nice uh, location data where we, were, where we were able to see where people were, were clicking uh, on some of these Bitly links from, um, and that was that was information that had a very high level of, of validity to it because they were they were pulling that straight from the uh, the IP addresses and they had that down to the country level, which was great. Um, gen doing gender at scale is tough. Um, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, not everyone uses their real name on Twitter. So, you know, if you're trying to judge based on the names of the individuals, that might be a way that you could get some people, but that would introduce some bias into the research because what if uh, the people that there's a major difference between the people who use their real names and people who use pseudonyms or who tweet from institutional accounts? And it's very difficult to, uh, to, to figure that out. Now, one way that we could do this, um, and if we, if we have time, we might be able to do this, is we've actually found it very fruitful to look at the, the most retweeted tweets. So these are the tweets that uh, they have disproportionate purchase and disproportionate degree of spread. And so one thing we could do is we could say, okay, let's try to qualitatively analyze it and, and, and code each of these names of the people who tweet these tweets. Uh, and figure out how many of them are, are women. So you could say, okay, well, there's a high, high proportion of women represented among people who make these uh, uh, top tweets or a low portion. Um, and so that would be one way of getting at that. I, I would just add that there's a couple of uh, a couple of women who are very prominent. They show up very frequently in our month by month uh, reenact, like uh, Rafi Shujati, who's a spokesman for the LCCs, uh, uh, Razaniat, who is a prominent uh, Syrian-based activist. Uh, but I think usually it's not because of their gender; it's because of their institutional position within the opposition and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I, you remember the gay girl in Damascus uh, fiasco, and you know the the issues that that raised with uh, with identity and gender, so we, I, I agree with Dean that this is not something that you can solve quantitatively. I mean, I think you'd have to actually know the identity of the accounts and, and dig in to specific things. But the, there's a group over at uh, Keras, uh, they've just done this, this amazing study of Aleppo, and basically going household, you know, using a lot of social media data, but also a lot of on-the-ground data. And that's, I think, what you would have to do, is to be able to dig in at the neighborhood, street level, to figure out who's doing what, what the role is in civil society, and service provision, and, and I think that's probably the, the model for how you would do that. We probably only have time for these four questions. We'll go ahead. Thank you. Uh, William Omens from George Washington University. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great report and reports, and I really look forward to seeing what you guys do next uh, with the with the more in-depth analysis. Um, I want to go back to one phrase that Mark used in particular, which is in real life. And uh, my question is, uh, is there another kind of uh, direction or another component of research that's necessary here um, to make the case that social media can be more of a proxy for sort of what's really going on? Um, and so when we talk about social, the role of social media in war and protest, how much do we have to start looking at you know, different sorts of methods uh, like ethnographic research or, or interviews to see what's actually happening kind of on the ground and then pairing it up better with the social media stuff. I know there's a lot of papers coming about about the potential predictive power of social media for sort of real events, but is that sort of the next step in your work and isn't that a necessary component? And maybe it would be a great book to uh, make a better case for the, the role of social media in the actual war and protest. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say really quickly, um, I think that methodologically you're absolutely right on point. We need that we need people talking to folks on the ground to figure this out. Uh, that said, I don't really think that the real, sort of not real distinction is uh, super helpful. I think what we might want to talk about more is uh, this idea of distance, people who are closer to the action on the ground versus far away. I think that if somebody, you know, if, if a lot of the news junkies who are in the long tail of some of these, uh, of the um, English journalist cluster over time uh, are, 
are retweeting and talking about this is not that it's not real. It's just that these people are not directly involved in the action. They are spectators rather than participants. Um, you know, uh, likewise, I think if you're looking at the Middle East, you've got people who have regional concerns, people who may be you know, in Syria itself. Um, I think that their participation is real in a different way, uh, and I think that they, uh, you know, what they what they have to say will be very different, um, and, and could be investigated by many of the. Um, uh, techniques that you talk about, but but I think we should, you know, the, the idea of distance, you know, further and closer, uh, I think, uh, is, is sort of a better analytical slice there. Taylor, anyway, why don't we do this? Why don't both of you step up and ask your questions together, and then we'll uh, okay. wrap up with one more here. Okay. I'll answer you later, Well. Okay, um, I have uh, two questions, and they're relatively uh, broad in scope. Uh, firstly, um, you've got a lot of great data on uh, activity, so uh, tweets, retweets, what's in them, uh, who sees them, you know, all this great metadata too. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your inferences and, and, and your thoughts on uh, not activity, but perhaps inactivity. Uh, so, you know, what could be revealed um, by uh, sort of, you know, when there's a, a lack uh, of you know one of these key players, um, and and you know what that might signal um, about you know influence uh, between or within groups. And and uh, my second question is related to that uh, in the sense that it was really interesting uh, your idea of of what I would call net importers or net exporters of tweets. You've got uh, you know some people are are, re are retweeted very constantly, and and then you know others they always you know take as opposed to give. Um, and I. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on on what that might imply for relative influence within or between clusters, because certainly with you know with Syria, it, it's you know there are all these big issues of uh, who has influence at any given moment uh, and who's taking it and who's getting it. Sure. Thank you. My name is Anatza Ragusti. Uh, I'm uh, the director of B'Tselem USA, which is a human rights organization, but I'm also an ex-journalist. And from what I know, I mean, journalism is about fact-finding. So how does that correspond with your findings? I mean, what I hear is a lot of chaos from coming from the Arab world, and we don't really know what's going on there. So correct me if I'm wrong, if this is my impression, if you have any you know, findings on the truth of what is really going on there. Well, Thank you. Maybe I'll go first, because I can tie them together a little bit to set up uh, Dean and Mark for more in-depth. But um, you know, one of the important things about understanding journalism is, of course, the gatekeeping function of journalism. And an important part of that is um, who journalists decide our legitimate sources. And that's really the one of the undercurrents of, of this report is the way in which certain people or organizations became considered legitimate sources. And because mainstream journalists are really the gatekeepers to the broader Western world, at least in this case, um, it became very critical to understand who those people were and how those people and who those how that evolved. Uh, over time, and we have, you know, anecdotal uh, examples in the report, for instance, of something that Mark alluded to briefly earlier, of, um, you know, some of the more important institutions or individuals that, that knew that mainstream reporters listened to them and thought they were credible, um, you know, getting video from the ground and realizing that it didn't look good because it was sectarian, for instance, and not not putting that up on their site. And so it got it did show up on YouTube, but on a site that nobody went to because they didn't consider it credible so no one saw it. Then telling the people they got this video from, you know, next time you gotta make sure you guys don't have any sectarian chance. So the next time there was a protest video, they didn't have the sectarian chance, but that doesn't mean they were any less sectarian. So the and that got published and, and made it in the mainstream press. So, you know, it's a very difficult job, you know, you're a former journalist, it's a very difficult job to understand who these people are and to make sense of it. And we saw, you know, a lot of very important uh, curators on the mainstream media side going to really great effort to try and do this, to establish credibility, to, to be clear when they couldn't, um, and that sort of thing. Whether or not 
we're getting the truth on the ground, you know, is a, is a relative term. It's been sort of a what Will was saying. But um, it's, I think what's interesting is that we're getting a lot of different truths. And, and there are, I mean, I don't mean to sound postmodern, because I don't mean it that way. I mean that there are different things that are happening. And I think it's far more interesting in a way, again, getting back to Will a little bit, that what we see in the English language media, particularly over the course of our study, really becomes not only insulated, but very different, but it's not it's not fake. It's a real thing that they're showing us. It's just not this other thing. And everybody else in the region seems to be looking at the other thing. And that sort of understanding that gatekeeping role, I think, is, is really critical. Yeah, can I just, one of the things which is interesting about the, the Syria, kind of the, the, the Twitter, the online universe around Syria compared to, say, Egypt, is that it's far more curated and, and far more organized. I mean, in Egypt, you had a lot of people who were out there kind of as individuals who were, so if you wanted to know what, uh, you know, Hossam Hamadawi is doing or what the April 6th movement is doing in Egypt, well, these are the founders and organizers and key activists of those movements, and they're telling you what they're doing. And in a sense, there, I think there was a, a myth, there was a less, intermediation there, whereas in the Syria, what you get is, I think, a far more organized campaign type of curation of information, like Sean was talking about. And so, for example, you see one of the most frequently retweeted tweets across the entire, again and again and again, is just a very basic, these accounts, they, they'll say, you know, the, my, the Twitter army, you know, please help us in spreading this information. And this will be retweeted thousands, just the appeal for help will be retweeted thousands and thousands of times. And then they'll choose a hashtag, and they'll choose the information, and they'll put it out. Very different from Egypt, which is, I think, far more anarchic. And when Skander is here, he can talk about it. But it's, a, it's very different. So from a journalist's point of view, I think you're getting, from, from the Syria side, you're getting what various organizations want you to get, for the most part. Whereas in Egypt, you were getting a whole, like, this kind of chaotic, everything is happening on, 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 on top of your square. This also gets to Will's point a little bit about kind of the, the real, what's happening in real life. Life. I would only add to, to Will, if I'm going to answer it now, is it depends on what question you're asking. A few weeks ago, I was presenting, presenting a paper based in part on, Sir, on Dean's uh, network data to an audience of um, kind of Civil War political scientists. And they came back and they said, well, that's really nice, but what does any of it have to do with the Civil War? And and it's like, okay, well, if what you're trying to answer is what is the network structure of Syrian discourse online, Dean's study is really relevant. If what you're trying to answer is what explains rebel fragmentation in Syria, maybe not so relevant. So I guess the question is really disciplinary and you know, what question you're trying to answer. Uh, can, can, I, can I speak very quickly to uh, the center perceived question between the clusters and what that implies for, for influence and all of that? So uh, there's trade-offs, right? So if you have a cluster, for example, that primarily is providing information to other clusters and other individuals outside of that cluster, that tends to look more like uh, a mass media model. It's something that pushes out information but does not pull uh, much in, sort of the, uh, uh, it's going out, you know, you're watching television uh, in that model. It's going out, but nothing can really come in. Uh, on the flip side of that, when you've got people who are pulling in information but not putting much out, you, if you're doing it from a number of diverse sources, what you're looking at is a model of sort of the, the ideally informed citizen, people who are getting information from a lot of different sources, uh, but they're not getting their uh, message out. Now, uh, I think whether that's good or bad depends on what your goals are, but, but I think that there are, there are trade-offs. And of course, you can have, you know, perhaps the idea would be both, having your information both go out in uh, large volumes and come in in large volumes. Um, or sort of at the other, you know, if you think about this in sort of a grid, uh, on the other corner you've got very little information that's going out and very little that's coming in, and that's sort of maximum insularity. So, so thinking about it in those terms, I think, helps to tease out some of the normative and is, is there a hybrid in between? Uh, well, so, right, so the, the hybrids are, you know, so you think about the group, the, I should have put this up, but um, you think about it in terms of uh, uh, many and few, and then uh, sent and received. So you've got many sent, many received, that's, you know, you've got, uh, you're, you're being well informed as well as you're projecting out. When you've got sort of a lot that are sent, but few that are received, you mass media. When you've got lots that are received, a few sent, you're sort of the ideal citizen pulling information. And then when you've got the last one that is very insular, very little going on and uh, very little coming in. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maria Stefan. I was formerly at the State Department working on Syria, now here at the Institute as a fellow. Uh, my question is about uh, bridging clusters in the Syria context. 
not bridging between Arabic and English, but the bridge that I mean is pro-regime, pro-opposition. Did you see um, any such clusters in your research? Uh, how large were they? What were they saying? Um, the Zainab question, did they translate into any action? Um, was there a difference between such clusters if they existed when the conflict was principally nonviolent versus violent? And what can we learn about bridging clusters in other highly polarized uh, conflict societies? Thanks. Sure, I'll, I'll start with, with that one. Um, the, the Assad cluster, um, it, well, okay, actually, I need to back up. So our analysis looked at the top 10 most uh, retweeted clusters, uh, or actually um, the top 10 most populous clusters, I should say, uh, within each month. And so uh, the way the algorithm works is it uh, decomposes a large number of clusters, over uh, well over 1,000 in the smallest month, and well over 10,000 in the largest months. And so the way it works is you have a very small number of very large clusters and a very large number of very small clusters. And so cutting it off at the top 10 means that we're looking at the, the largest clusters uh, within that month. And so uh, within that framework, the pro Assad cluster emerged fairly late uh, in the analysis. I think it was late 2012 uh, in which, uh, where we first saw it. So there probably was a lot of pro Assad clusters that was happening, uh, uh, activity that was happening um, below that cutoff, but it really only rose to that top 10 uh, arena uh, in late uh, 2012. A second thing I want to say is that um, we haven't looked at the, the bridges there yet, but I just wrote the code last weekend to analyze um, these individuals and pull out these individuals who uh, are heavily retweeted by multiple clusters. When we break that down, we can see whether the Assad cluster uh, is, is heavily linked to other ones, and if so, which ones. Uh, so far, we've seen that the Assad cluster is very, very insular, very closed in terms of, of how it interacts with other ones. So so there, there may be very few individuals who are able to bridge to bridge those in a substantial way. Let me just say qualitatively about this, um, about the, um, the pro-Assad cluster, Cluster. It's not a like regime cluster per se, and, and it's, what's fascinating about it is it links together when it emerges uh, identifiably uh, Shia uh, uh, individuals and figures from across the Gulf, Lebanon, and Syria, along with regime supporters, and I would actually go so far as to guess that a number of people who are like mainstays, fixers of that cluster would react violently at the suggestion this was a pro-Assad cluster. In other words, they would say that we are anti-opposition um, and that, uh, but we are not pro-Assad. Um, and so it's very interesting, the, the, the dynamics of that, of that cluster. But it's extremely insular, and to the extent that there's interaction going on between them when I see it, it's almost always in this kind of hostile interaction kind of way, like making fun of each other. It's like, oh, look what they're saying now. Can you believe these people? Like that sort of thing. We're, we're close to intruding on the start of the second panel, but we've been monitoring this on... on yeah, I'm just, I'm here and... I'm here on behalf of the uh, online audience, extremely active audience, and I'm just going to ask one question um, about the English uh, language journalists and how insular they are. One, are they really aware of this insularity? And two, is this having any impact on policy, and what impact is that having? Right. Um, just to, just really quickly on this, uh, this is some late-breaking analysis that I just completed uh, last week. Um, basically, uh, what, happens, what happens with the, so the English uh, language cluster becomes more insular over time. What happens is that actually coincides with a, uh, a dramatic increase in the number of Arabic speakers on Twitter. Uh, so what ends up happening in, this, in the Syria conversation is that from the start of the Arab Spring to uh, the end of this um, time period, the number of Arabic-speaking users uh, they're talk that specifically they're talking about Syria explodes. And so what happens is the English cluster you know, gets basically gets crowded out of the conversation and they get sort of corralled into their own little uh, cluster until that last month of August 2012, when what happens is a bunch of other people that aren't normally talking about um, uh, Syria all of a sudden start talking about it. So in that August 2012 uh, cluster, whereas all, of all along you've had this English journalist cluster, you've got American conservatives, you've got American liberals, you've got some, some uh, British folks, uh, and a couple, and, and I think one other one. Um, and so, uh, what ends up happening is that a lot of the, the sort of interconnection and, and inner uh, uh, conversation happens uh, on the Arabic uh, speaking level. The, the, the English um, accounts that 
tend to break through through a lot of this are like Sarah Palin, um, Glenn Beck, um, uh, it wasn't Rihanna, it was so, uh, Nelly Furtado right. or someone like that, um, <laughs> when, when she retweeted on it, like things like that are when it tends to break through for a, a lot of that period. Um, and it's often in a very partisan way. There's one very popular tweet that was, you know, about Obama running guns to uh, the Syrians, just like Fast and Furious. Like, very partisan, like a lot of people doing the exact same tweet again and again. A lot of stuff like that um, in, in, in English speaking, uh, in, in that, little, that little cluster. Yeah, I don't think English language journalists are, because of what Dean said about this coinciding with the, you know, influx of Arabic language, Tweets. I don't think they're aware of what is, that they're not aware of. I think they just keep doing what they're doing. How it affects policymakers, you know, I presumably policymakers have access to intelligence and all sorts of other things that influence their decision making. But to the extent that public opinion has some influence, we don't want to exaggerate it, but has some influence on policymakers. Um, the, the public is going to get that information and process it through, of course, their partisanship and everything else. But this isn't an issue that really divides easily on partisan lines in the United States. And so the information that they're getting from the media are particularly maybe more salient than in normal foreign policy crises. So it's all the more interesting and important to understand what that story is that they're seeing and how it may or may not be different from the stories other people are seeing. And can I say one other thing on, on the policy question is that there's two, actually two different ways to read uh, the data that we have here. One would be to say that you know, the English-speaking journalists and the Washington policy community are convinced that American policy is the most important thing that matters in Syria, and yet the data shows that, in fact, very few people actually care about it at all outside of Washington. Uh, that would be one way of telling the story. The other way of telling the story would be looking at that August 2013 spike when Obama talks about uh, uh, bombing Syria, and suddenly it goes through the roof, and then the, the, the second way of interpreting the data would be to say, America was absent, it wasn't leading, therefore nobody paid attention to it, but as soon as we talked about intervening, suddenly it becomes the, the main story again. So I don't think there's any obvious, I mean, there's multiple ways that you can interpret the politics or the, the, the policy impact of America's relative absence from, the, from these Twitter discussions. Well, the great thing about uh, uh, the great measure of a panel is that uh, you're forced, because of time, you know, to end the panel before all the questions have been answered. But uh, join me in thanking Sean, Dean, and Mark for a wonderful panel discussion. We'll take a 10-minute break uh, and then reconvene. All right, we're going to get started now. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, PJ Crowley, for another great discussion. I come cheap. So, um, we, if we, if we have some fascinating perspective on the Arab uprisings at uh, now into their uh, third year, um, we we can we can. Uh, add to that perspective, but also compare what we've seen over the past uh, three years with what we've seen over the past several months. Um, you know, the great thing about being you know, professors in the space is that you have no shortage of case studies. Uh, so here we have uh, Adel Eskander, uh, adjunct instructor, communication, culture, and technology at Georgetown University. We have Zainab uh, Tufeki, uh, assistant professor, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Any Duke fans in the audience, you can get an early line on the March Madness. Uh, and Joshua Tucker, professor of politics at New York University. Uh, so we're going to do um, Egypt, Turkey, and uh, a, a most significant topicality, uh, Ukraine. So. I'll take it away. Thank you. Uh, well, first and foremost, thank, thanks so much for, for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and a delight and an honor to be uh, in the company of, of colleagues. Um, and um, it's, it's always difficult to talk about Egypt and the social media largely because Egypt gets a, a significant amount of attention uh, and, and fanfare when it comes to um, whether it's you know discussions of Twitter and, and Facebook. Uh, Egypt is, is heralded as a success story, or at least had been uh, for a significant period of time. Uh, and so 
much has happened in an extremely short three years. Uh, and uh, and if one were to look at Egypt as, as a case study, uh, it's a case study for both uh, the social media um, uh, flourishing as well as faltering at the same time. So we have uh, sort of moments of jubilation and moments of uh, absolute melancholy and, and real sort of uh, disconcerting uh, evidence. Um, I, of course, um, I don't do sort of the kind of research that uh, that um, that Mark and Dean do. Um, so I can't really speak of um, the actual sort of patterns of, of distribution and uh, and content uh, creation. But I can tell you a little bit about um, how the political quagmire in Egypt uh, helped precipitate shifts within the social media and vice versa. Like the sort of the strange homeostatic relationship between what happens online and what happens offline. So I'm going to skip over what you probably know and have been following um, in the first two years years, from 2011 to uh, the, the current moment. Uh, and we have some pretty startling transformations uh, in, in both patterns of use in the social media as well as the political climate that underlies. The first, first and foremost, uh, we often talk about the Egyptian social media scene as being uh, sort of indicative of a very sharp digital divide, uh, that a significant proportion of the population is disconnected from, from online uh, spheres that are not part of the dialogue. And, uh, and therefore, they're completely marginalized. Uh, this is starting to shift significantly as we see a, a sharp rise and a proliferation of use of, of the internet uh, across the country, perhaps even uh, in the amount of 10%, a 10 increase uh, in about a year and a half. So that, of course, is very startling. But what that does uh, is, um, to a large extent, uh, open up and, and, in a sense, also egalitarianize uh, the distribution of information online. Uh, by egalitarianizing, I, you know, I mean to an extent that the 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 voices that we typically used to hear from online are also changing. Uh, they're changing because their convictions, their views, their perspectives on the political circumstances are are changing as politics become much more polarized and much more uh, and much more contentious. But uh, but egalitarianized also from the sen in the sense that uh, we have entire constituencies, entire sort of social classes within. Egyptian society that are making their way online. Uh, they may, they may, they may not have been the early adopters, but by the time they they become entrenched in this community, they are providing uh, a sort of a, a, a whole new sort of lens, analytical lens on what's happening in the social media. So, there, so the social media environment in Egypt is becoming much more diversified. Um, and it also sort of shifts the, the bias, if you will, that we typically associated with the Egyptian social media. We often said the social, the social media in Egypt is predominantly activist, predominantly revolutionary. That is no longer the case. Uh, in fact, it's one might argue that it's quite the contrary. Now, the the, clus the, the major clusters or the major nodes that we're accustomed to hearing from, they were sort of the key figures, the uh, the informants, if you will, from Egypt, the prominent journalists and, and reporters and, and activists are still uh, the individuals that we glean our information from uh, here uh, in the West, the folks who are actively uh, actively translating content into English to make it comprehensible for Western journalists and Western media and Western policymakers, they're not necessarily the trendsetters uh, in the Egyptian social media scene anymore. Quite the contrary. Where now there are, there's a whole sort of parallel uh, realm, another ec echo chamber, if you will, that is proliferating and growing quite significantly that doesn't necessarily care to speak to those communities or to send those messages internationally. And those, and this community is also diversifying, and it may, in many instances, be very counter-revolutionary and very critical of, of revolution. Um, uh, the other sort of complicated dynamic is that uh, we've seen a major shift in the way in which discourse is expressed uh, online. Uh, whereas in the past, or at least in 2011, we associated most voices online to be dissident voices. Today, they are, the dissident voices may be the much, much more silent or much quieter. Uh, so today's sort of government propagandists uh, are sometimes tomorrow's dissidents, and today's revolutionaries are sometimes uh, tomorrow's apologists.
interests for, for a government. And that happens in, in the ebbs and flows of, of political transformation from a time when the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces was in power and we knew who the contrarians were against them and then of course, and, and we knew who the apologists on their behalf were. And then again, when with the Muslim Brotherhood in power, we, have, we see that shift again and with the removal of uh, Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood from power on July 3rd, we see another sort of, uh, another page turn. Uh, and so it's extremely important to, to note that uh, any sort of transitional uh, interpretation of what happens in the Egyptian social media scene um, has to be historicized. You have to understand that this is happening at such moment. Such and such individual said this on this day, and, uh, and it has to be sort of contextualized within that realm. Because a month and a half later, we can see a complete transformation, not only in this individual's expression, but the implications, uh, the political implications of this expression. Um, there is a significant, at least nowadays, uh, we see a significant decline in 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 politics on online. Politics, I mean, politics in the way that we've grown accustomed to it. Uh, in the year, in the in 2012, in the year when the Muslim Brotherhood were in power and there was a significant level of opposition, uh, the sort of the contentious nature of online politics uh, led to a, a real sort of burgeoning space uh, for expression. Uh, today, that space is narrowing, and, and it may be narrowing because of a, a sort of a spiral of silence, to use sort of communication uh, scholarship, that those who feel that their opinion is in the minority uh, tend to be quieter. Uh, and then there's a sort of a chorus of criticism that shuts down particular spaces of these online, uh, uh, online discussions. Uh, what I'm particularly interested in if we're, if we're not going to look at dissidents necessarily in, in the way that we used to think of it, which is, uh, you know, there's a protest in X and uh, X, Y, Z location. It leaves at such and such time. We're all going to mobilize from, from here to there. And, and the use of social media uh, as, a, as a portal for, uh, for collective, collective action, um, there's, there's another form of dissent, if you will, that I think is much more creative, which is basically a, a shift from looking at uh, uh, the use of social media as politics versus leisure. I mean, we often think of how you know we use social media here, or the majority of the population uses social media here, versus in Egypt. And there's a tendency to look at the Egyptian social media users as highly politicized. So there's always this sort of challenge uh, of politics versus leisure. But now I think there's politics as leisure. Uh, most of the critique against the sitting government now, and arguably the one that preceded it, uh, that of the Muslim Brotherhood or the military-backed government now, uh, actually uses humor, and I don't mean humor in the sort of in the cliched sense that all Egyptians are funny and they all crack jokes and we all know about you know the Egyptian sense of humor. All of that is is a given. I I expect that to be the case. But uh, more importantly, uh, Egyptians are are uh, effectively leveling some significant political critique in the form of humor, and this humor it manifests in very interesting ways. Whether it's uh, in the form of uh, sort of user generated content like memes. Uh, for instance, which distribute very widely. I mean, they're not, uh, you know, they're they're not frivolous. It's not frivolous, um, you know, uh, interventions. These are really significant political interventions uh, that that can be extremely damning for the institutions in power. Um, but the question is, who's laughing? And that's, I think, the, the critical point. So even though humor and, and satire and parody is being used as a form of political critique, uh, the compartmentalization and the real polarization in Egyptian's political scene means that uh, a joke can be funny for one community and really just an, an extremely abrasive and offensive for another. Uh, and so to look at the sort of landscape and the spectrum of political expression online today, especially in the context of humor, uh, we can really understand what all of this means means. Um, I sort of, you know, in a, in a very crude way, a very simplistic way, um, I think of the Egyptian political scene online as sort of a sort of a very, very large, but, you know, extremely simple, because I'm not a, a quantitative researcher and I don't really understand mathematical models very well, but like a Venn diagram is like grade school, right? But like a really, really big Venn diagram with various sort of overlapping circles, and each of those communities share something in common, both politically and in terms of uh, uh, sort of, uh, and in terms of expression, what they find funny or what they find interesting or what they find uh, sort of uh, um, subject to critique. Uh, but the one thing that most most of them sort of have in common is that little that little sort of central uh, 
a, a, a coordinate of, of overlap, uh, which is that each member of a community online believes with conviction that they are part of a revolutionary movement. Uh, whether they are you know, members of the April 6th movement, uh, youth movement, or if they believe they are members of the Muslim Brotherhood who are actively pushing against, uh, against the coup in Egypt, or if they're even sort of former Mubarak supporters, uh, what Egy in Egypt people call the Fulul, they too participated in a, in a sort of a, a, uh, an act of political populism against a sitting government, and they too believe that they are revolutionaries. So revolutionary discourse effectively subsumes all public expression in social media, but the, con the, the real point of contention is who's a revolutionary? And that, I think, is uh, uh, speaks to the, the core of the polarization that exists in, in Egypt today. And that's what makes it extremely difficult for any, for any one community to really speak on behalf of a revolution versus a counter-revolution, uh, uh, the state versus, versus non-state actors, civil society versus, uh, versus uh, institutions of power. Um, so so this is, this is the realm that we're in today, which is extremely diff different from what was an extremely, what was a very, very simplistic dichotomy, a binary between you know, good and evil, us and them, uh, the state versus, uh, versus non-state actors, civil society versus, uh, versus the military and what have you. So unfortunately, that's where we are. But it also leaves room for some really interesting uh, um, uh, analytical and contextual work on how uh, communities express themselves and what they mean mean by these uh, expressions and to what extent uh, they can they can further change or uh, push for change on an incremental uh, level both online and effectively or eventually offline I have a few slides so um, I want to talk a little bit about what happened on social media and offline, also in Gezi, a protest in Turkey. And I want to also bring it back to a few of the methodological questions we're all trying to grapple with. You know, what happens when you get Twitter big data sets and how do you think about them? So, part of uh, what happened in Turkey was what is referred to now as Penguin Media is that there is massive censorship in television, in mass media, in broadcast. It's a very complicated form of censorship. It is a mix of um, a lot of large conglomerates basically buying big media, mass media, as a way to grease their contracts in other sectors of the economy with the government. So an energy conglomerate will go buy a major television station, which will likely be a loss in making. It won't make money for them, but they will use it to do very pro-government um, broadcasts, which then they look good to the government, which then uh, helps them get contracts from the government in the other sectors they're active in. And there's also new sort of reports coming out of direct government intervention. So, but it's a complicated scene, right? So the government intervention and self-censorship by mass media um, creates an environment in which a lot of sensitive news did not make it to mass media first. It made it to social media first. The Gezi protest was one of multiple such events, so it didn't just come out of the blue. There had been, um, the military had accidentally bombed um, Kurdish smugglers in the southeast region, and the news first broke on social media, even though the television newsrooms were aware of the news uh, about a year before Gezi. And they were, the newsrooms, the journals were following, and they were kind of unclear on whether they should go ahead and broadcast this news, which of course is a major event, right? 33, 36 people died. It was a very unfortunate incident. Because the news first broke on social media, people started using social media as a way of getting around the television, the mass media sort of self-imposed search sometimes, and sometimes government intervened uh, blockades on news. So when uh, the Gezi protest started as a very small incident, Overall Park, that's not that big a deal, but it became symbolic. And long story short, a lot of people started hearing that there were clashes in this region, in this uh, biggest square in Istanbul, basically one of the central squares, but that wasn't on televisions. The clashes start, grow, grew and grew 
Well, it still wasn't on television. So if you turned on your television, you weren't getting the news that in the major, you know, in the biggest city in the country, in the biggest square, there were 24-hour, 36-hour long nonstop clashes with the police and protesters, which is major news. So what happened was the CNN was um, showing Penguin documentaries at the same time as the clashes had gotten so tumultuous that CNN International was broadcasting live from them. So somebody put their television side by side and said, here's CNN Turkey, here's CNN International. And that became the symbol of this unlikely symbol, the penguins. In fact, the next week, you know, people started calling CNN and requesting documentaries for uh, penguins as a sort of disruptive <laughs> thing. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of documentation of this. I've documented multiple times. There would be something major going on which would be considered news in any other context. And you would turn on television and you wouldn't see it on your television. So, uh, and uh, you would watch, I, I watched personally interviews with major um, government you know, officials on Turkish television where they wouldn't be asked any serious questions. All the questions were softball. So that created trust in certain sectors of society that television wasn't covering the range of news that you would normally be seeing. So non-penguin media makes um, this resurgence. This is Occupy Gezi, Pen these became sort of symbol symbols that you saw everywhere. And remember, Turkey is a very wired country. Like unlike sometimes in Egypt when we're talking about the Egyptian um, social media scene, there's a lot of sort of like how many people are these? Well, Turkey is a pretty wired country, half the country is online. And it's not that, and this is another misunderstanding, because our prime minister made the statement that Twitter's a menace to society. He made it in a couple of days into Gezi. People sometimes think social media is only anti-government people. Absolutely not. Pro-government people, anti-government people, pretty much a large section of the politically engaged society in Turkey is online, is on social media. It has one of the highest use of Twitter um, in the world. So the, if you have this notion that the ruling party is, you know, the major, main people in the ruling party are not online, are not using social media, are not up to date on how it works, you're wrong. There's very much a lively uh, public sphere of its own kind there. So, so this also became like this the symbol. So the, 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 this is of course Bansky. Um, made into the Turkish version. It says, the diren is a Turkish word that came to be uh, used like occupy. Uh, so the, the penguin media and the non-penguin media became a major source of um, contention. Now, what happened is I wanted to get multi-level data, so I went there. Yeah. I didn't just want to watch it online. <laughs> and unlike scraping, I needed a helmet because there's a lot of tear gas canisters being lobbed into the park occasionally. And tear gas, while awful, is not likely to kill you unless it hits you in your, you know, in your head. And since I'm an academic, that's the part of my body I really need. So I only <laughs> need uh, a tape recorder and uh, my helmet. So I went there and I um, did interviews for. Um, well, basically, till the park was evacuated by police force at the end of it, I was there. And the whole time, I mean, it, again, people had this idea that there's, you know, there might have been, there wasn't anything like Egypt where the internet was unplugged. In fact, the internet was functioning very well during the park the whole time. Now, this might have been also due to surveillance concerns. You know, the government, because in Turkey, if you need to get a, a cell phone, which my cell phone is a Turkish cell phone, you need to give your citizen ID. So there's a sort of the flip side might be that it's a surveillance environment. But at the whole time, the internet worked really well. Uh, people were able to sort of um, use it. And a lot of things that you didn't think, you know, we said didn't happen in Egypt, happened in Turkey. For example, people don't think that uh, people use Twitter to coordinate action on the ground, like during a protest. They did. I mean, I was there, and people would very much, because fun, partly because, you know, again, it's a more modern country, better off country. Uh, a lot of people have um, sat, uh, for smartphones. So what would happen is there would be a massive amount of on the ground, real time coordination people did using social media. And um, 
So sometimes I would get people from abroad saying, what's happening uh, in Turkey? They would ask me, the prime minister would make a statement, and they would ask me what's going on. And I'd say, I have no idea. I'm on the ground. I don't see. We look on Twitter. I mean, look on some place else. There's really a very different view from being in the middle of a sort of a protest area versus being on social media and looking from top down. And which is something that I want to say. A lot of the sort of the analysis, for example, that uh, and I love that paper. I love the analysis. But you have to remember, there is no audience besides the team you just saw speak who's looking at tweets using the word Syria. There is no eyeball that is looking at it as a whole. It's good for analysis. But if you're actually going to look at how is social media impacting people, you have to start from the people up. You can have big data, but you still have to start looking at people up. Because for example, there's, I mean, I saw, I heard the word crowding out, and I don't think there's any crowding out really in the Syrian space. What you have is different audiences that get bigger and larger, smaller, because there's nobody once again looking at you know, there's no sort of this uh, bird's eye view uh, except the researchers themselves. People are sort of partial. Everybody's seeing small portions of it. It depends on who they're following, what they're thinking. So the story I heard is that English-speaking audiences were largely tuned out besides the journalists. And then they tuned back in when Obama um, made you know, certain statements that there might be intervention possible, and they tuned back out. They did not push the Syrians' conversations on or off the um, sort of the space because they're not in competition for a limited space. What's happening is from the eyeballs up. So I went and I interviewed uh, these protesters. I also looked at the big data sets. This was quite interesting because I wanted to, I, I'm going to highlight a few things about sort of this online offline inflection because I think it sometimes gets into the nuances of how to do this. So if this is um, from the same source you guys have, actually, but this is somebody else that published. This is the top 20 hashtags that were associated with the Gezi protests. If you look at them, um, you know, you see this huge spike when people start using the hashtag. And then you see this huge fall. If you just looked at this, you might think that around June 3rd, the protests had died down. What had actually happened was everybody stopped using the hashtags, or even using the word Gezi, because there's nothing else you could talk about. That's just, everybody was so focused on that. In fact, there were jokes on, you know, when is it gonna be safe to talk about, you know, stuff again? Uh, the Turkey's Onion was joking that, you know, the sort of the fledgling few people who wanted to Instagram their food were wondering when it was gonna be safe again, because you would get run out of the social media room if you talked about anything but Gezi. And this was true, not just, you know, on, this was true for, I follow a wide range of people, I follow pro government people, I follow people who are in the Gezi, I have friends on sort of across the political spectrum. This is what everybody was talking about. Therefore, the word Gezi just didn't appear. The word Occupy Gezi didn't appear. The word Diran Gezi didn't appear. But you don't see that, right? Uh, so this is one thing. Another thing, see, every social media space, it's a cultural space. It has social norms. Uh, I've not seen this elsewhere, and I'm super curious if you guys see this elsewhere. This is what Turks do. This is, she's a, a pro-government, uh, influential um, columnist. And what she's doing is she's criticizing three anti-government people, but she's not mentioning them. She's not linking to them. She does these screen captures. So this is algorithmically invisible to any big data set. Now, how common is this? This is such a hard thing to capture. What I did is I have a diverse sort of data set of people I follow. And I've occasionally done things like when people discuss a lot of politics on social media, which is like Egyptians, it's late at night. Now, there, if you, you want to ask an Egyptian something, 3 a.m. is usually a good time. It's sort of like that in Turkey. It's like you know, 12, 1 a.m. And I followed like chunks of people, about 200 people, and I would find hundreds of such screen captures in an hour period. So there's this enormous actual quoting talking that is algorithmically absolutely invisible. And in the Turkish political social media sphere, this is super common. This is very, very common, common enough that there's no analysis possible without it. It may not be common elsewhere. I'm just sort of trying to point out, and this one, you couldn't even OCR. I mean, they, you see this is kind of twisted, so it would be a little hard. Subtweets, I put an English 
stop to it so you guys can figure this out. This is Blake, uh, who got quoted in the last uh, panel too as a one curator. He used to be um, stationed in Qatar and now he's deputy editor of Politico. Pretty sort of pop person. And he's, he's saying getting crowded under that bus. 64 retweets, 55 favorites. You're like, what? Uh, he tweeted that during uh, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's uh, press conference on where he blamed every aide in the building and you know their relatives for what had happened with that um, <laughs> the, the scandal over traffic and bridge and everything. So all Blake says is getting crowded under that bus and everybody knows what he's talking about, right? You have 64 people retweeting this. This is a subtweet. This is what they were talking about. Now, again, how common is this thing is a real question. In some social media places, this is very common. Some, they're not. So in Turkey, this is a Turkish example. That's why I showed you guys the English one. Pro-government, pro anti-government, they're absolutely talking at each other. If you speak Turkish, you know they're referring to each other, maybe if you know the context. But it's so hard to tell. There are many times when I see these communities talking at each other, subtweeting. And I know they're seeing the other one because half an hour later comes a response and then the other person snipes back and then there's another one. This is, this is really engaging. In fact, I picked this one because this was so obvious to everyone, not just the thousands of retweets. This got mentioned in mainstream media as them responding to each other. If you knew the context and if you knew who these people are and if you read this thing, you immediately knew what they were referring to. But there's no names or links or, you know, it's kind of, it's not talk, it's a new kind of cultural form. It's not talking behind people's back because you know they're possibly going to see it, but you are not going to give them the link or the mention. It's kind of like talking. It's a new mixture of things. Again, I have no idea how common this is in the Syrian social sphere. Very common in Turkey. Gaming. This is our colorful mayor of Ankara. He is... Oh, he's very active on Twitter. Again, 3 a.m. you go, I don't know when he sleeps, right? He's like constantly tweeting. He tweets himself. By the way, he's the pro-government. He's AKP's uh, leading people. And what he decided to do was he wanted to counter Gezi by creating hashtags that would trend. Now, trending is something that Twitter doesn't tell you how things trend, but people have reverse engineered it. It's a... a inverse document frequency kind of um, algorithm. In any case, what you need to do is have a hashtag that is not a common word, keep it close to, and then everybody use it all at once. That, that spike is what produces um, the trend. Otherwise, Justin Bieber would trend all the time. They're trying to get rid of <laughs> such things. So what he's doing, see, he there says, hey, people, here's our um, hashtag. Stop lying, CNN. It trended worldwide. I had people asking me, well, what? You know, because uh, I had friends asking me, why is this trending online? Because it was, it was a game space. So because it's a human space, what you are watching is a very deliberate, reflexive action by people. So what does it mean to look at trending? Uh, so currently in Turkey, we have a very active, politicized social media environment. Once again, pro-government, anti-government. Now the pro-government coalition is kind of splintering, so there's like multiple factions, all of whom are battling it out on social media. There's a potential mass media social media divorce. I'm trying to get underway a survey that gets at this, uh, because half the population is not online. And it's unclear what they are seeing, because mass media still remains fairly uniform in what it does and does not cover. There's some government attempt to bring social media under control. It's not just beat, it's beat and join. They're there, they talk, they're very active, uh, but there's some legal, in, legal changes that bring a lot more user surveillance. Uh, that's the most worrisome part. And some, um, some very complex uncertainties. What I'm trying to say, uh, you know, to end, is that I think it's absolutely crucial to look at the big data. I mean, I, when I look at the Turkish big data, Twitter big data, it's really striking. But 
you have to triangulate. Like any other method, you have to get offline data, you have to get mass media data, you have to get other kinds of data, put it all together. And methodologically, you have to start from the people up. Even if, I mean, for big data sets, you really want to see things which look at what are people seeing in a big data way. I mean, a lot of our research is what are we able to see. And what we are able to see as researchers is not as consequential as what are everybody whose individual eyeballs are seeing different sort of worlds. And we could also aggregate that and have a huge big data set that looks at what are people seeing, who are they following, what are their uh, streams are looking like. And that uh, is all I will say before coming to the other current event. Is, will this never end? <laughs> this has been a crazy couple of years for this area of study. Thank you. Yeah, where do we go? It's just down here. Is it in the same folder? It's in the same, yeah. Uh, okay, so we're good. All right, great. <coughs> okay, <coughs> thank you very much uh, to Mark for inviting me to participate here. It's, a, it's, it's wonderful to get a chance to be here. Um, I want to uh, start off just by saying that the research that I'm about to show you is uh, from the NYU Social Media and Political Participation Lab that we've set up. This is generously sponsored by the US government's National Science Foundation, so uh, your taxpayer dollars at work in, uh, in, supporting, uh, in supporting really uh, important academic research. The goal of our lab is to do two things simultaneously. One is we're trying to understand social Social media as a new variable. The world's changed. There's social media in this world. We want to understand how it affects political participation. The second thing is that as social scientists, as policy analysts, as anyone who's interested in how people around the world interact with the political sphere, actually interact with all phases of social life, um, we have an enormous new data set at our exposure, enormous new, enormous amounts of new data available to us to study individual behavior. So our lab is trying to also develop social media as a form of data to make it accessible, to develop tools that we can use to study how people behave. So sort of two overlapping uh, tasks. I'm going to talk to you here. I've, it's been very, I've, I, I was invited here to talk to you about social media in Ukraine. Uh, a couple of you may have been at the talk that I gave at IFAS a couple weeks ago. Well, and so obviously I had the talk ready a couple weeks ago. I could just, you know, use the exact same talk today and there'd be no problem, right? Okay, so Ukraine, this is going moment by moment uh, as we talk. So uh, let me just quickly talk about a little bit about what we've learned about social media usage in Ukraine and maybe what you, social media has taught us a little about what's going on there. All right, so we had talks before about people using social media to organize and, and I'll show you we were doing this as well. We're using five talks before about people using social media to contact the West, to be in charge, to touch with the West, right? Ukraine may have been the first time that we've actually seen negotiations taking place on Twitter, right? So this was earlier, you know, way back in the early days of 2014, January, um, <laughs> when there was a negotiation going on about what was going on between the government and the opposition in Ukraine. This was Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who was one of the opposition leaders. There was a deal offered by Yanukovych. This is obviously this becomes a recurring theme in what's happened in Ukraine. But there's a deal offered by Yanukovych to the opposition. How does the opposition reject it? The opposition rejects it on Twitter. No deal. And this is actually tweeting at, this was the president of Ukraine's Twitter handle. So this is a tweet at the president. <laughs> We're finishing what we started. The people decide our leaders, not you. Now, as we've been coming, a theme that's been going on throughout, everyone's been talking about here, note that this tweet was in English. Now, here's a whole bunch of Yatsenyuk's other tweets. Some of them are in English, but some of them are not in English. A number, lots of other tweets are in Ukrainian, right? What's the result? The result is that within hours, you see on the New York Times, unmediated, transmitted to the world, exactly what Yatsenyuk said, right? No deal. We're finishing what we started. The people decide our leaders, not you. This is a really valuable tool to an opposition leader in the middle of a protest situation in a square where there's violence in the square, right? But you don't have to have a press conference. You don't have to worry about getting mistranslated. You write it in Twitter, it shows up in the New York Times, right? Yes, or three hours ago, as of when I was on the train this morning grabbing this thing, so this is now a whopping six hours ago, which probably means it's completely out of date. Um, but uh, 
uh, Arsen Avok, another uh, Avok, Avakov, another uh, opposition leader, announces that criminal proceedings are being brought against Yanukovych. How does he announce the criminal proceedings? This actually says Yanukovych has disappeared. <laughs> right. <laughs> Later on, they announce that they're announcing criminal proceedings. How does he do it? This is on his personal Facebook page. What do we see again? Within hours, on the New York Times, Ukraine's acting interior minister issued a warrant for the arrest. How do we find out about it? Avakov made the announcement on his official Facebook page, right? So this is a new way of people in conflict situations, in civil unrest, of communicating, right? You can, as an opposition leader, communicate directly with the outside world on why you're going to do this. And I think we're going to see this more and more being recognized as a, to as a tool of people in these kind of civ civil things. All right, what else can we say about stuff? Um, Twitter usage in Ukraine has increased over the course of the protests. This, again, was the figure I showed, you know, we showed way back when that our lab produced for a, a post at the Monkey Cage, which is a, a blog that I write for at the Washington Post, along with a number of George Washington University uh, professors. Uh, this is the first thing we showed up. And we compared it to research we had done on Turkey. These were much lower numbers. So we were seeing much less Twitter usage in Ukraine, uh, 1,500 tweets per hour, 1,000 tweets per hour, maybe 2,500 tweets per hour. Um, and we were trying to figure out, so what was Twitter being used for? It was less popular than what was going on before. Now look at Twitter usage this month, okay? As things broke on the 18th of February, which was the biggest day, and then 21st to 21st, now we're seeing 10,000 tweets per hour, 20,000 tweets per hour, 30,000 tweets per hour, all right? So this is in the course of a couple of months, same set of collection words, keywords that we're using here. You're seeing dramatic increase in the amount of usage of Twitter. Um, and Twitter in the Ukrainian context, interestingly enough, has been serving multiple audiences. We've seen tweets in English, as I showed you before. We've seen tweets in Ukrainian. We've seen tweets in Russian. What's interesting, though, is that in these absolute moments of crisis, and we have January 19th in here, and then we also have uh, the events of the last couple of days, huge spikes in the amount of English usage right on these keywords. Some of that is coming from outside um, of Ukraine. Obviously, there's just much more international attention. People are using the hashtag Euromaidan to be talking about this. But some of it's obviously the kind of things that we're showing before, attempts to directly communicate uh, with the outside world using these different, uh, using social media as a means of communication. Um, now, what we showed, but the other thing you can pick up here, which I'll come back to in a second, is obviously Twitter usage is responding to events. We can pick out the big days, right, January 18th in here, or February, the last few days in February, um, in December when the squares were clean. We can pick out all the sort of big events in the Ukrainian crisis. We can, if we had all this data, you can go back essentially and recreate what happened by seeing. So Twitter responds to what's going on. Um, Facebook also responds. Right. Um, so both Twitter and Facebook, what this is, is it shows the graphs of sort of likes, comments, and shares uh, across uh, Facebook posts. But we see at every moment of the sort of main moments in the crisis, we see these dramatic increases in people liking Facebook pages, becoming signing up to follow Facebook pages, and sharing what's going on in Facebook pages. All right. So what's happening here? Um, Facebook, what's interesting is that as time has gone on, more and more of what's been appearing on Facebook has been primarily in Ukrainian, right? So here's a picture from earlier on in the protest. This is still in December. These are needs on the, things we need on the Maidan, right? These are actual coordinating devices. Here are things that we see more recently, right? Just in the last couple, just in the last couple, uh, last few days. Maidan, doctors of the Maidan, right? This was a Facebook page that was designed to show where there was need for healthcare on the Maidan, right? This is your Euromaidan SOS. This is a, a thing that was set up to coordinate emergency responses on the Maidan, right? This is the actual one of the Euromaidan, the actual sort of Facebook page that they have. Again, we see this all sort of in a Ukrainian, all playing these kind of strong coordinating roles uh, for what's been going on here. Now, the other interesting thing that's going on with Facebook and this comes from uh, survey data that was done by Olga Unik, who's at uh, Nuffield and Harvard this year. Um, she had ran a sort of rolling survey of people in the Maidan and asked them questions about, a lot of different questions, but asked them questions about how did you find out when and where you should go to join in the protests, right? These were people who were at the Maidan. What is interesting about this is that, you know, we do see that the top choice here is I saw on TV that people were protesting, so I joined in. But if you look at what I've, we've got circled here, right? My my friend family member said they were going on Facebook. 40%, yeah. right? Now, 
This is much lower, much, much lower down here. I received a Facebook invite from a civic organization, right? Olga and I had a back and forth about this. She sent this to me. She ended up doing a guest post about this survey on the monkey cage, and she said, oh, I want to push back on what you guys are saying about the importance of social media here, because only 4% of the people say, oh, it's because they got a, they saw that, read about it on Facebook from a uh, social, from a, a civic organization. But my response to her was say, I think actually it's the opposite. You may have here the sort of greatest, the single largest just documented effect, I mean, and we don't know if the survey is representative, we don't know anything, you know, let's put all the caveats about running a survey, but they're trying their best to get a sort of random sample of people around the Maidan, right? If this is correct, this may be the single greatest effect we've ever seen documented of how social media and involvement in social media led to people actually participating in political action, right? Now, the key thing here, which I think is important, is that it combines the two things that theoretically, I think, make social media most interesting. And in our lab, we sort of have, it's an interdisciplinary lab that we've set up, and we have political scientists who tend to focus a lot on information and utility calculations and cost benefits. We have lots of models about whether you join protests based on your expected benefit from being in the protest, the cost of being in the protest. In that sense, we think social media is crucially important because it may affect information, right? It may affect what you know about the costs, what you know about the expected benefits. But the social aspect of it, and we also have a social psychologist on the project as one of the co-PIs of the project, co-directors of the lab, right? The second thing about social media that's so important is obviously the network effect. And we've seen graphical displays of the networks. Well, here's another way we see the networks, right? It's that you're hearing from people who are in a network that you've self-selected yourself in to join. These are your friends on Facebook, right? They're finding out about this on Facebook. So Facebook is providing a way in these protests to facilitate communications between networks that you've previously decided to join. Right? And according to this particular piece of survey evidence, this seems to be very influential in helping to get people onto the Maidan. Um, now, what are other things we learn about this? We've learned from looking at the social data here, social media data. As I said, Twitter clearly responds to events on the ground. Right? So this is something that is now being used. Twitter is being used, we think, because of the English aspect to spread internationally what's going on on the ground. We also know it's being used for coordinating roles on the ground. But it clearly is jumping when you see big events taking place. However, and here's something that's really interesting that much less has been said about, what we've also seen in Ukraine is that the number of people getting on Twitter also responds to events in the ground. Now, this is a more compressed. Uh, this is a more compressed because we wanted to show more time. But these are again from our data set of people who've tweeted about events in Euromaidan. Use these hashtags that we put to collect, uh, to collect this data set when their new accounts were created. And what we see is that every point where the protests heat up in early December, in January, and then bam, in the last few days. More people go sign up for Twitter accounts when these big political events are happening. So there's an endogenous relationship here, right? Twitter, or social media, is helping to inform people about political events. But at the same time, political events are driving people to social media, right? So the relationship is reciprocal. And we, this is we thought was fascinating when we first sort of saw this. The other thing I just want to stress is that we tend to think, and there's been a lot of discussion, and there are a lot of here. We want to, we always want to dig deeper, right? This is the tension with big data. We end up with data sets that are too big to hand code, right? I have, we have a data set with this Turk, with Turkish Twitter data that's got 93 million tweets in it, right? There are not enough undergraduates in the world for us to pay them to code all of those, right? <laughs> so we have to go back and forth. But the danger, of course, is that you go straight to the big data and you don't know what's lying underneath there, right? So I'm, you know, going back when these things and reading, and if I was here giving, Zainab is on the panel for the Turkey, if I was here giving the Turkey talk, I would show you a whole bunch of tweets that we translated that actually illustrated a lot of things Zainab was talking about. Tweets in Turkey that said, you know, really specific effects of peer pressure, like get out of the bar and come to Gezi, you know, like very specific at people's friends and stuff like that. Um, with Ukraine, we're not, we're a little bit behind <laughs> on that. But one of the things that I want to say is, so I think there's always this tension and we want to get in and see what some of this stuff is, but we want to get in and see what some of this stuff is in part so then we can then teach the machines to how to code this stuff because we can't code all this stuff by hand. So it's not just we want to read some of the stuff because we want to know what we're talking about, but the, what we're also really trying to do in our lab is then use that information to then go and train the machines to go extract the information that's important. So one of the things I want to say is that we think of Twitter, right? Twitter is this 144 character way of conveying information, right? We tend to think of it as so limited, these short 
short bursts of text. But Twitter, much as Zainab was showing where you could do screen captures, right? Twitter's visual, right? And so one of the things that we can do here is we can see what it was that people were seeing on the days of these protests, right? So this was, according to our calculations, based on the data set we had, this was the most retweeted picture on February 18th, the day that sort of Kiev went up in flames and people started getting killed, right? This had this was this particular picture was was included in tweets as a retweet over 1,500 times, right? This picture got tweeted over a thousand times. This is the one where lock and loaded people were going in with the Kleshnikovs, and one of the big stories in Kiev became about the changeover from rubber bullets to real live ammunition, right? And the question of whether there were snipers. This picture of of the Kut guards, who are the sort of elite security forces of Ukraine, walking in with these locked and loaded Kleshnikovs went all over. And this picture you may have seen as well. Right. So this is what Twitter was actually communicating to people. And we're looking, each of these has over a thousand retweets. And that's a bare minimum, right? Because that means a thousand people saw this and sent it on to their followers. This is a multiplier. So you're talking about images that can easily be seen by a hundred thousand people. This one then gets picked up by the news. Some of you may have seen this in, in mainstream media as well. Uh, pictures go up and throw these things, right? What are the pictures from yesterday, right? From Sunday? Well, do you know what this is? This is the boat that Yanukovych has installed on his private residence uh, that functions as a restaurant, okay? This is a gold chair from inside Yanukovych's palace, right? And this is Yulia Timoshenko, who is now being flying on the way, being flown back to the Maidan after having been released from prison, the opposition leader, right? So the dramatic difference between what the tweets are conveying and the information that this is being made out there. And all of these pictures, again, are getting massively uh, retweeted and disseminated. And the speed at which this occurs is just sort of stunning, right? Like, nobody had seen the inside of Yanukovych's palace before, what, Saturday? <laughs> Right, Saturday morning. Sunday afternoon, this picture gets retweeted 1,500 times. I mean, I'm sure you all saw the pigs and the wild boars and the goats and all that sort of stuff on the news too as well. But this is this is just sort of an incredible ability for this stuff. And and one of the people I was reading, you know, there's also a picture of the cars in Yanukovych's um, garage. And like, you go back to Tunisia, right, and Ben Ali and the private cars and stuff like that. This is something new, right, where the way that these images can get spread, and it's almost like this is becoming a new new phase of the revolution, right? The spreading of the pictures of the opulence of the deposed leaders. Um, so in summary, what we found is that, you know, I, and I, I would go so far as to say it's becoming increasingly difficult to imagine, you want to, what's the takeaway, right? Like, it's becoming, from today, it is becoming increasingly difficult to imagine protest movements that don't utilize social media. So if you want to understand protest moving forward, what leads to protest, the dynamics of protest, you have to get a handle on how social media impacts protest. And this is one of the things we're trying to do. We're writing papers about, testing hypotheses about, and these kinds of things. But one of the interesting, fun things about studying social media is that if you go way back in the dark ages, right, to 2009, <laughs> when you had the first Twitter revolution in Moldova, which then turned out to be like, well, maybe there were only seven people with Twitter accounts in Moldova, although that's also wrong too, right? But the sense that, okay, so these things, you get, you get pushed back and say, oh, it wasn't really a Twitter revolution, or you get to the Arab Spring, oh, people weren't, as time goes on, right, anyone who pushes back and says this stuff doesn't matter, well, the next one is just there more and more and more. And by the way, I could have given this talk about Venezuela this morning, too, right? Like, that broke in the last couple of weeks while we were following this, and our Twitter feed on Venezuela went crazy over the weekend also, right? So this is, I think, crucial for those of you in this room who are our policymakers, who are thinking about how we anticipate responses, how we estimate political unrest around the world, getting a handle on how social media impacts this, it's not, I don't think, it's hard for me to imagine anyway, and I'm interested in hearing opposite perspectives, but it's hard to imagine this is going backwards. Right, that we're going to be in less networked worlds and where people have less access to instant information transmitted to them via networks in these kind of protests. All right, so what do we see in Ukraine? Uh, social media is being utilized in, in the Euro was <laughs> is being was being whatever it is right now. Social media has played a big role as was playing a role in the Euro Maidan protest. Facebook, we saw a lot of things about organization, but it was also a way for probably social uh, uh, pressure to be brought to bear on people to participate or to learn that your social network 
works, to put a less um, pernicious term on it. Twitter has played roles in international outreach and undoubtedly in real-time communication. Um, very interestingly, I think we want to take away from this is two-way effect, that social media may pro facilitate protests, but protests may also bring people to social media. And social media, I think, is more than text, and I think we want to keep reiterating that, even if it becomes even that much more difficult to study things that aren't text, but it's a crucial piece of the puzzle. So thanks very much, and looking forward to the discussion. So um, to start off, in the summer of uh, 2009, uh, Maxwell, uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, famously wrote the article, uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted. Um, if we were updating that article in 2014, would there be a new headline? Well, it was wrong even then. <laughs> uh, I want to say, uh, just in Egypt, uh, I, I have a publication with survey data. Once again, it's a protest survey data, so how representative it is is always shaky because it was the survey was done at the height of the um, clashes in the 2011. And there, 28% had heard of the protest first on Facebook. Uh, and the sample size is similar to uh, about a thousand people. And this is Egypt, which is much, much, much less connected, uh, right? There's fewer people. So even in the Egyptian um, situation, be partly because of the sort of media censorship versus what's going on on the ground, um, that was important. Now, Malcolm Gladwell's argument was that this is all weak ties, and you can't do a protest with people's weak ties. So that was the crux of his argument. Well, it's wrong in multiple levels. And he, he gives the civil rights um, era as an example. First thing, social media is not just people's weak ties. I mean, that's, I, I've, I've never seen empirical research. There's some weak ties, some strong ties. Um, places like Facebook, you tend to have more some, depends, right? Teenagers have their strong ties on Twitter and their weak ties on Facebook, where because everybody they know is there, it's like, a friend of mine, Nathan Jorgens, who called it decoy social media. They help little old ladies cross the street twice a day on Facebook because their parents are on Facebook. Whereas on Twitter, which is very public, they have their close friends, which is their strong ties. So social media is not just weak ties. Also, uh, there's this idea that social media is this virtual world and it has you know, some weird effervescent presence. That's not true. Even in Egypt, when I, I interviewed people who told me, like, I'll tell you the story as it was told to me, a political person in a family that doesn't speak politics and is from a relatively well-off family is like young, goes on Twitter, says, I want to find people like me. This is before the you know, first uh, uprising, and then finds people and then gets involved in the protest and ends up in Tahrir for those 18 days. So those weak ties can be turned into very strong ties. So that was uh, the case. I think Malcolm Gladwell kind of way of looking at the world is both misunderstanding how protests occurred in the past. If you look at civil rights movement, what was the key thing that spread the sit and counters you know, from Greensboro to elsewhere? It was television. It was not people's strong ties. College students saw it on television and said, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. So if we were updating it, of course it'll be tweeted, what else? But it's not ever just tweeted because it never was just tweeted. It's always has been online, offline, all mixed together. And I think you made a great case. What you see on social media, since they're your friends, it has a pressure on you. If everybody you know is out there, you know, getting beaten up, and you're Instagramming your lunch, that is not going to work. Um, so I would say he was wrong then, he is wrong now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways to think about this. Um, one way to think about it is that it is technolo technology is moving forward, right? And regardless of the argument, and it was sort of fun, people jumped ahead and said these things mattered a tremendous amount in Moldova, and then there's pushback and then back and forth. But no matter what happened in the past, it's more and more in the future, right? And every time we see movements emerging right now, there are these social media components to it. Now, of course, it's important not to confuse that with saying there's no other components to it, which is, I think, a point that we're all in agreement with, right? But to ignore it and say that you have these movements that come about and that they're not, that social media is not playing a role in the ones that are successful, I think is, is a mistake. But the more interesting question, I think, to be asking 
is to go back to at least the th sort of theoretical argument which he's making, which is to say, instead of putting it in such black and white terms, right, and saying there are good social movements and there are bad social movements, right, <laughs> the question is, what are the different dynamics of social movements that emerge, of movements that emerge over social media? One dynamic, I think, and, and to say what, how are they fundamentally different from uh, movements that may have emerged through sort of top-down traditional organizational structures, right? One thing about it, clearly, is that these things can come out of left field in a way that, you know, might have been harder before. You might have been able to be a policy analyst and you look and say, oh, is there going to be instability? Let me look at the organization. Let me look at the cells. Let me look at the groups, right? One of the things we've seen recently, and it wasn't just, by the way, it wasn't just, I mean, the speed at which this has happened, the indignatios to Turkey, to Brazil, to Ukraine, right? Like, the speed at which these things can happen. In Ukraine, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, if you had surveyed Ukraine experts, right, on December 1st and said, are we heading for a massive upheaval, right, in the next three weeks, it would not have, you would not have thought this, right? But you get one event, you get one reaction, you get a bad reaction to it, boom. So I think the question, so one thing I think that's obvious is that these things can emerge and they can emerge. Now another question is gonna be, right, do movements that emerge, protest movements that emerge in these kind of faster ways over social media, do they end up having different sorts of demands? Yes. Do they end up having different rates of success? Are they more or less likely to, uh, to turn violent? You know, these are all, I think, very fundamentally important research questions. I think Gladwell's attempt was to say, they're all just gonna fade. Right, that they're not going to be real because of these strong ties. Right. Well, it might be sort of. It might be. I mean, one thing to look at is the sort of demands that come out of it. And I'll stop. I'll wrap up with this. But if you look at the Indignatios in Spain, and people correct me if I'm wrong here, but in a sense, the Indignatios never were able to get a concrete goal, a concrete demand out of that protest movement. Right. If you look at, however, what happened in Ukraine, that even though this movement may have emerged with a sudden speed and with a sudden reaction in a similar way, there was this agreement over the resignation of Yanukovych and that Yanukovych had to go, right? And that may have been new for this kind of this kind of an approach. And so we may see like things like a central focusing idea, whether you have central focusing ideas become much more important because in older days, you, with an organization, the organization itself wants to perpetuate itself. People were running that organization. So you have these, you know, you have people who are invested in this point. So I think these are the kinds of interesting questions we should be asking. It's going to be tough to follow, but <laughs> let's see. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be a little bit of a contrarian and say that, um, again, and I'm a huge advocate of historicizing, but if we were to look at that particular moment in time uh, when Malcolm Gladwell put out that, that article, um, we have, well, first, we have sort of a, a head-on collision between him and, and Clay Shirky from the standpoint of, you know, is purely technologically determined versus, you know, socially determined. And and I think that, uh, that speaks to a, a a juncture where the the technological innovation in and of itself um, had very limited capacity, very, very limited reach, and to sort of play off of what what Zainab said, um, even discussion of you know weak ties and, and strong ties factors in, into the research that we're looking at today. I mean, Josh's sort of um, notation about the the finding from the Ukraine protests, where um, what is it, forty percent of the of the fault of the people surveyed said that they uh, they decided decided to go up down to the main. Maidan uh, specifically because they had seen a message posted on Facebook. Well, if you look at it from a purely sort of uh, instrumentation standpoint, then it affirms the the role of the social media as a technological tool to draw people into the square. But if you were to look at it from Malcolm Gladwell's sort of social psychological interpretation, it says the the first part of that statement says uh, friends or family members posting on Facebook. So it is the level of, of social proximity that people have to it now. Egypt, you know, Egypt. The reason why Egypt became so uh, so so strange and so complicated is because, as Zainab said, uh, the initial sort of impetus for participation was largely out of loose ties or weak ties. Uh, when I came out on January 25th, I didn't know a single person who who was going out into the square. I mean, it was basically these virtual spaces of people who had, uh, you know, ideological agreement or sort of a general conceptualization of what might be problematic in the country politically, and the call in and of itself was generated entirely online versus anything that may have been uh, made its way or seeped in through mainstream media or traditional media or various other tools. Yes, there are people who were coalescing and organizing behind the scenes, but as far as the mass distribution of the message, it existed largely online. And so I think 
um, it's, it's, it's partially unfair to sort of discredit the argument in its entirety today, given what social media has become and its level of breadth and depth. Um, I think it was, uh, it was too hasty of, a, of, a, of an argument, one should say. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, if we want to understand how all of these dynamics work, uh, we have to also look at it from, from the standpoint of basic interpersonal communication and social psychology as well, which brings in an important argument that exists within Malcolm, Glad Malcolm Gladwell's general conceptualization. He may not be right about innovation. He may not be right about the role in which technology is used as a catalyst for social, for social mobilization. Uh, but he has something interesting to contribute that I think will, will live on. And we will begin to discover as we triangulate and as we uh, become much more interdisciplinary in the study of, uh, of you know, big data and everything else. I think, in one sense, Gladwell will make two arguments. I think one was discredited, which is um, loose networks impelled through social media, in, in, to some extent, could not upset the status quo. Obviously, on that, he's profoundly wrong. He, he may pro be proven right in Ukraine in that, that loose networks may not be able to translate a protest momentum into power. They, the, in Egypt, they weren't interested. Uh, and uh, you already, already see the implications in Ukraine about the return of Tymoshenko and what that means and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll do one more question here. We'll do one question from online, and then we'll open it up you know, to the audience. So if we come back to Egypt, for example, you had Tahrir and then you had Tamarud. What's the difference? Or, 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 or you know, was there a difference in the role of social media uh, from one to the other? I'm really glad you asked that question. I think, um, uh, of course, social media uh, sort of scholars are less interested in Tamarud because of the, ex the 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 kind of the channels of, of outreach and mobilization. For the most part, the the epiphany that happened, uh, I would argue, the moment that Egypt had its first presidential election, specifically the second round of presidential election, when 49 percent of the of voters came out and supported the member of the old regime, it was this sort of, wow, we didn't realize that a substantial proportion of the Egyptian population supported the regime with everything that it represents. Um, so it raised the question of whether or not, um, you know, the the whole sort of historicization and discussion and the discourse and the narrative of revolution, if it really sort of exists in a tiny little crucible called the social media and the um, the really sort of entrenched um, sort of um, independent and, and private media that had something to gain in this, or various political interests in, in the case of the Muslim Brotherhood and various Islamist groups and 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 sort of secular progressive groups that where. Where is this? Where, where, for the first time, we're concerned about public opinion. And so, when Tamarud first uh, started, the intention was to go beyond the 32 percent who have internet access in Egypt and really sort of go turn it into a grassroots movement across the governorates. Keep in mind that the entire revolutionary movement in Egypt was largely urban. I mean, at the end of the day, we were focused on Tahrir Square, and we're looking at other sort of parallel squares uh, in other sort of metropolitan areas like. Alexandria or Suez or Bursaid, but the majority of the population in Egypt exists in areas outside of these urban metropoles, which means that where do they stand in all of this? And so when Tamarud's uh, success large, is largely a result of an extremely basic uh, you know, mobilization, which is to take a piece of paper, photocopied by ordinary people, uh, you know, at their own expense in most instances, and going sort of door to door to try and get people to sign it with very, very simple demands. Now, the social media dimension uh, may have been may have been large, but at the very but it was the tip of the iceberg, below which there was a, a real sort of mass movement. The protest movement of January 25th was completely the contrary. When there isn't a capacity to utilize public space for mobilization, and and you're really sort of communicating to a small small constituency of like-minded individuals, you get a completely different realm. So the total the total participation in the January 25th revolution in all of its 18 days is probably, again, you know, the estimates and the, you know, one could do the arithmetic and geospatial sort of arranging. And this, of course, becomes a very contentious issue in Egypt because it's a competition between different revolutionary movements. But the total capacity or the total participation in the Egyptian uh, revolution of the 18 days could possibly be in the range of like one to two million. 
again, I'm throwing, I'm throwing numbers out there, but the total capacity in terms of the distribution of information and the knowledge and the, and the anticipation of the June 30th protest movement, because of the, the capacity to you or the decision to use uh, sort of a, a paper, um, you know, a paper um, uh, uh, petition, if you will, um, expanded the both the the breadth and the depth of the movement in such a way that it is fairly conceivable that we could speak about at least 10 million people participating in the protest and and both through you know um, you know anecdotal and, and and in terms of the the, the breadth the geographic breadth of the protest movement is very very sizable so uh, does that mean that the the uh, utilizing sort of non digital uh, mobilization tools uh, trumps the social media in in the case of the June 30th protest I think it was uh, an it was a combination of the political circumstances the general climate in the country and more importantly the decision to uh, to utilize all tools necessary so the Tomorrow movement represents sort of a maturation of the of the relationship between the online and offline, rather than looking at them as two disparate realms that don't interact, but really sort of bringing them together in such a way so that it becomes a sweeping movement. But again, keep in mind that there were always sort of the there are always fissures and there are always sort of the uh, the blind spots. And so there, even when it comes to Tomorrow, there are always blind spots. What was missed? Uh, you know, uh, where was the support? Or was the state involved in any way? I mean, all these things are, are extremely interesting to keep in mind, nevertheless. Well, I want to pick up on something that's sort of floating out there. Um, there's two things, and I, I really, sometimes I get tagged as a cyber optimist and a cyber pessimist at the same time, and that's usually my take is, you know, yes. Uh, I think there's one key way. I've written this article in Digital Media and Learning published it. It's a... MacArthur funded uh, sort of this blog. There's a boom bust cycle to these, right? There's a boom bust cycle to these social media fueled events that come out of nowhere. Um, M15, Turkey is going through that. Egypt kind of had this. Occupy kind of had this. There's a sort of great boom bust. And partly, so what's going on here is one thing. And my take is that the one thing that we thought was great about social media, lower coordination costs, actually has some negative side effects. And I think the one thing that everybody dismisses about uh, social media, slacktivism is clicking on like, I think that might be its strongest effect. So very briefly, so in the past, if you needed to organize a march on Washington, you needed to organize logistics, you needed to organize buses. If you wanted to do the Montgomery bus boycott, you needed to organize carpools. I mean, they met every single night. If you read their memoirs, I mean, it's this intense amount of work just to organize the carpools because these are poor black people. They're not all going to boycott going to work, right? They are gonna to go to work. They're gonna to walk to work. They can't always walk to work. The amount of logistics that it undertook to do a protest has gone down dramatically. And in our theory, it says it's usually cited as something that's going to increase social movements, which it does, I think. You can organize Gezi protests like this without having this organization that had to do months and years of logistic work. But all that logistic work left you with an institutional and organizational capacity that was crucial to the second step, and the third step, and the fourth step. So now that you can do something easier, I sometimes likening to climbing Mount Everest by being helicoptered into a base camp. And then being, you know, you, you, you don't build certain kinds of muscles that were tedious and awful and horrible to go through. And you can do the street protest spectacle, which can have impact. In Ukraine, it's had impacts. In Egypt, it's had impacts. So I'm not dismissing the street protest spectacle. But let's not be asphalt fetishists either, right? I mean, where does it get us to be able to put on spectacular street protests? Sometimes it gets us a lot. Sometimes it doesn't. In the case of Turkey, the political opposition is weak and incompetent and fractured. Long political story. It basically means that the spectacle of the street protest is not communicating to other political processes because they could do it without building the muscle necessary to do that street protest. And also think of the, to bring it back to the US, think of the first internet protests, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the SOPA, PIPA, the blackouts. 
that were so influential because a lot of congressmen we saw like went from I support this to no I don't support it. What happened then? If you remember, there was this going to be this pretty awful law. It was unenforceable probably. And Google and Tumblr and a lot of sites connected people who landed on its website directly to congressional people. So Congress people were getting 10,000 and 100,000 phone calls and they panicked because in the past, a 100,000 phone call deluge signaled an organization behind it that was maybe gonna challenge on a primary. Street protest no longer signals the same organizational capacity. So for a government, it is now a question of can you write it out? Because in a month later, you, there's no organizational capacity to challenge you if you're able to write it out. You may not be able to write it out. I mean, it depends, right? So I think the, spec the lower coordination costs are actually depriving movements of muscle building that wasn't always fun or great. On the other hand, I think what people deride as slacktivists, the sort of symbolic part of social media, I think that's the long-term most consequential thing. I mean, to dismiss the symbolic sphere in human life is insane. I mean, we, you, we started with UNC Duke jokes. I mean, people die for flags, which are, you know, and language and identity and ethnicity. Most of our motivation is from this hugely symbolic sphere. So changing perceptions in a socially embedded way, those little likes and clicks that everybody dismisses might well be the longest term impact. The Turkish social world is completely changed as a result of what is happening. People think differently, and those online, the uh, epistemological effects of the intervention online, but it's hard to watch, right? So I think the street protests are weak in policy impacts because lack of organizational capacity that was necessary, but are strong in biological impacts. If you, if you participated in Tahrir, if you participated in Gezi those 18 days, you're a changed person. If you participated in 1968 anti-war movement, you're a changed person. So, by a, so a lot of real impacts might be long-term, including the likes and these things. So, you know, I love studying the protest movements. There's a lot of interesting stuff, those spikes and things like that. But I think there are ways in which there's these longer-term, deeper impacts uh, and they're not going to play out the way people think where slacktivism quote unquote is going to be I think very impactful and I think lower coordination costs are coming back to bite a lot of movements in this boom bust cycle. But just to add one dimension to yeah. what Sainab just said, this, this ability by institutions to ride out. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have two cases now. We have one, Morsi, who never got, barely got to finish the first year of a designated term, and Yanukovych, who didn't get a chance to finish you know, the fourth year of a designated term. So it, it, it does this speed you know, yeah. put additional pressure uh, on, on, for want of a better term, systems? Yeah. Um, so just to, to make three points quickly about this. The first thing is, is uh, I think we need to get, again, I, want, I, I think it's important to get away from the sort of uh, paradigm that Malcolm Gladwell unfortunately put us into in this sense of good protests and bad protests, good organization, bad organization, right? Um, what we want to do is theorize about the factors that the dynamics that affect protests as the component of that protest that's driven by social media increases. I think that's the most important thing for those of us who are social scientists who want to understand how protest takes place and also for policymakers who want to understand implications of this, right? And I think there are, and like there are all sorts of things that we're identifying in this panel that people are talking about in their research, that people are talking about in writing about these things, right, where, um, where there are dynamics that come out of these things, and I think we can start to learn something about what those dynamics look like. But to start saying that the only, right, the only good protests are the kinds of protests which have large-scale organizational structures behind them, right? that somehow that's better than other types. I mean, let's think about it from this perspective. right? Social media may lead to protests where the costs of joining that protest are lower. The costs of going to zero to 60 undoubtedly are lower in terms of getting people onto the streets. right? But that may not lead to the same thing that happened after you had civil rights organizations that organized for 15 years, right? But there are lots of cases where people can't organize for 15 years right. beforehand, right? And this may give people an ability to put things on the agenda of politicians who are either trying to, uh, to trying to counteract current events or trying to avoid them in the future that they didn't tools they didn't have at the disposal beforehand. There are regimes that don't allow people to organize. And so the most likely case that you're actually going to get large numbers of people on the street is if you don't have years of small 
small little organizations that the regime can go after, but that you have sudden dramatic moments that catch the regime by surprise. Right? There are people who we know have fewer resources to devote to things like political organization. People who are single parents who are working two, 15, you know, two jobs 15 hours a day aren't going to go out and join organizations that involve you know, massive time commitments. But might they be willing to give a little bit of time in a concentrated period of time when lots of other people are giving time? Absolutely. So the good versus bad thing, I think, is the wrong paradigm to be in. Right? The paradigm to be in is there are different dynamics, and we have to identify what those dynamics are. The second thing that I want to say is I, the digital organization is organization. Right? We have to stop thinking that the only organization that matters long term is a bunch of people who meet with each other in a coffee shop, you know, to plot strategy quietly while smoking pipes, you know, in the back room. Right? Like an email list of 200,000 people who are all willing to give $10 to a candidate in a local house race. That's organization, even if you've never met those people before, right? Uh, 100,000 people who sign up to like a Facebook page, and then when you post information on that Facebook page that says, today's the day, and you know it's going to show up at 100,000 Facebook feeds if Facebook puts it there, which is another matter entirely, trying to figure out what Facebook is doing with its algorithms on who's seeing what. And we should not, those of us who are studying this, should not underestimate. We're not sure what people see. And I agree, there is, this is a big area for research. We've got to figure this stuff out. And there are Reverse engineering things that we're talking about are very are really important in this regard. But that's a real resource. That's an institutional resource. We had, I was teaching a course this spring in January on social media and political participation. And we had a speaker from Occupy Wall Street coming in. Occupy Wall Street doesn't think they're in the doldrums right now. They think they're doing really well because the minimum wage, rising the minimum wage, seems to be one of the most important agenda items on President Obama's agenda right now. And has a realistic chance, well, I don't know, I'm not gonna, I'll leave it to you guys to say, <laughs> whether it has a realistic chance of being enacted. But we just saw, who was it? One of the big companies just announced, uh, Gap, Gap Old Navy, Banana Republic, just announced they were going to $10 an hour. Occupy Wall Street sees this as a tremendous success. What they are doing now is using this, they, the, I mean, the most interesting thing from this talk, I wouldn't, I, this was my words, not theirs, but it was almost like the protests were a loss leader to get a big movement of people who could be coordinated and who go to the same social media sites, read the same blogs, and can be motivated to get agendas on, affect the political agenda in the country. Right? So they don't see it as a lack of success. I don't know what similar people think in terms of Ignatius. So this idea that digital organization is not real organization, I think is a misnomer, and people are going to be caught by surprise if they think that digital organization is not real. Um, the final thing is that you know, I really think that Zainab is absolutely correct about this thing, where getting people who don't traditionally think of being politically active I think this is, you know, this is what we might call a bit of a tipping model, right? There are an awful lot of zeros in this thing, and then there's a bunch of people who participate, and they range from, you know, 0.1 to 1. If we have some scale or index we make of the amount of participation people do, but those clicking on likes or joining the move on uh, email, signing one of those online petitions, and then you get more information about stuff. It may very well turn out to be that there is, in terms of a kind of internal efficacy mechanism, which is thinking you can have an influence on politics, that getting involved in just one of these things. That it's signing, clicking a like on a politician, it's a gateway drug, right? In the sense that you click a like here, you get on an email list here. Next thing you know, you don't think of yourself as completely divorced from politics. And over time, I think that may turn out to be, and it may be part of the reason why we're seeing more spread of more political movements in more ways in the last few years than we have in previous years, because there's a greater and greater base. The, big, the other thing that I think, and this is one of the things that I'm working on in my own research, but I think the idea, one of the things that's happening with Facebook, with Twitter, is we are inserting ourselves into networks voluntarily that we feel like we have a connection with. But most of those people in those networks, we wouldn't normally hear about their political views, right? If I stop my colleague, you know,'s wife on the street and say hi to her on the street, she doesn't normally say to me, you know, I support Wendy Davis. You know, she says, I'm the, but if I'm on Facebook with her, I'm hearing about that, right? And you have these networks where more and more people are being exposed and finding out that more and more of their friends and neighbors have political thoughts. And the question is, do these networks that we insert ourselves into in these social media then create the groundwork for having a belief that we are part of a community? And when members of that community urge political behavior, we may be more receptive to it. Or when you finally get onto the street, 
to protest, if there are people there who you've been talking about it with these issues with on Facebook, a year, two years, even if it was simple, just a little bit of knowing what's going on, have we massively expanded the amount of people who we think of as being vaguely politically relevant in how we think about politics? And that could also have a long-term effect. And I think that could be part of the answer is why you suddenly see these out of nowhere uh, movements emerging because we've setting the groundwork for it by allowing these sort of fora where people can discuss what's going on in politics. And this may be, we a lot of what we've thought about in terms of social media and protests has been in more authoritarian regimes. This may end up being just as important for more democratic regimes as well. What's happening online? Um, I want to uh, congratulate our online audience. We've just got spammed by the same people who are spamming I Love Your Selfie and Alec Baldwin. Um, <laughs> if there's ever a sure sign of online success, that's it. Um, but I want to ask a couple of questions from our online audience. Um, Max, a question for you. Um, do we have any information about how the pro-Russian camp is tweeting and whether you know they're really active online? Um, and secondly, how insular, sort of reflecting Dean's qu uh, analysis, how insular are these conversations? Are they, is there a big pro-Western insularity to this uh, conversation that's going on? And then sort of to the rest of the panel, a question about Venezuela. How does that uh, fit these trends that we're seeing on, in all of these regions? I don't know the answer to the first question yet. I mean, we've, we're tracking some websites that were set up or some Facebook pages that were set up originally that were anti the protesters. And this is the thing where we have to sort of get in there and start digging in and, and, and seeing what's going on in there. This to me though, by, by the way, is the second most interesting question that is, uh, that's out there about social media and political mobilization at this point in time, which is that how does the regime use social media to try to deal with mobilization? And so we are, uh, we, we, and this is something we absolutely want to explore, and maybe Vanna can talk a little bit about this in Turkey, because Turkey's been the big example where we know the regime went out and hired people to try to get involved in social media. And this is where the kind of network analysis that Dean was showing us in the beginning, as the next steps you have to start taking place and seeing what's going on with these things. It will be incredibly interesting Right, what seems to have happened, here's my hypothesis, right? I haven't looked at the data. But what seems to have happened is that very quickly, <laughs> a lot of Yanukovych's support has dissipated, right? Among Party of Regions, the Party of Regions, which is supposed to be his party, came out with a statement blaming him <laughs> already, right? The support has dissipated really quickly. So what would be interesting to see is if this becomes reflected in the social media networks, right? If we see a change in the shape of these networks as the questioner asked, from sort of more insular within the Russian community, within the Ukrainian speaking community, within the sort of protesters. And again, these are very sort of naive, broad stroke generalizations about things. We'd have to look at what these look like. We want to be very careful about ascribing political, uh, political positions to people based on language usage. But it would be interesting to see, and this is one of the really big, fun, interesting questions to ask about social media, that you can actually study because you have the data, right, is whether it's elite led or mass led. And so it'd be really interesting interesting to see, right after the Party of Regents starts breaking with Yanukovych in the last 24 hours or so, if we suddenly see a correspondingly shift of the masses in terms of who's retweeting whom, who's following whom, and whether we can, we can pick that up afterwards, or, or even more interestingly, if we can see it predating it. Right? We have a paper in our lab where we're doing this with congressional data in the US. We're looking at all the tweets by members of Congress and we're looking at all the we're looking at tweets by their followers, trying to classify them into different topic areas and seeing is it the members who are leading the discussion and then the followers pick up on it or the members reacting to the discussion. Well, we could do the exact same thing in the Ukraine case, which is to see maybe part of the reason the party of regions deserted right, Yanukovych is because they saw that their own network was crumbling already. So those are interesting things to look at. But the data are just, some of the data I showed you today are from three hours ago, so I can't, I don't have that yet. Okay, um, what we'll try to do, we've got about 20 minutes left, so perhaps direct your yeah. question, if you can, to one member of the panel, yes. we'll get that way, we'll get more questions. Yeah, and it's a good segue from the previous one. Uh, ben Homer, I'm a graduate student of the New School, um, and Josh, I'm really interested in talking to you, especially because the I'm going to do work in uh, New York, uh, the Venezuelan community. Uh, oh, great. Okay. So yeah, I definitely yeah, want to uh, But we'll Zena, I'm, I'm more interested in, uh, in the point that you made before, Turkey has hired something like 6,000 internet monitors, basically, uh, and it seems if you're a smart government, that this is probably, you know, you've seen what's, been, what's happened, this is probably a good policy uh, to have, is to have some kind of strategy for dealing with uh, people who could become problematic to you in the future. So I wonder what, what yeah, your... So, um, very interesting things, so, so many questions. 
Can I take 60 seconds to say something about one sure. question? So the digital organization, I mean, absolutely, communication is organization. And what I should have said is that being able to organize using digital media sports different cultural norms like being leaderless is a lot more possible because you can do it on social media and being leaderless movement has different long-term institutional impacts so uh, communication as an organization i'm totally there with you and i think there's a cultural trend towards leaderlessness which never used to exist in turkey which came up in gezi and it just blew my mind because turkey has never had spontaneous leaderless movements and i think the fact that they, and, and it's had it and i was like what country is this we were really, we know, with Turkish opposite, it's always hierarchical, it's always institutional, it's always leaderless, I mean, leader, very, you know, factional. So I think it leads to different cultural possibilities which then impact in being social media organized, so parenthesis. In terms of, um, I think the Turkish government buying fake people or not is um, overrated in importance because once again, look at it from the point of view of the person. If you are sweeting Twitter and a big data, it looks like there's a lot of them, but nobody's following them, so who cares, right? If you look at actually from the people's point of view, they are following people they know. So you can hire a million people you want, and if nobody thinks they know them, right? You don't just look at random eggs, you know, have Twitter people who don't have on Twitter, and all of a sudden decide, oh, I am wrong. You look at your, you know, offline and online and intertwined. People are not following random people. Spam accounts are good for spamming hashtags as we are being spammed, right? They're good for misleading big data researchers. They are not good for convincing people. So you can buy all the accounts you want, it's not gonna get you anywhere. What you can do is you can pollute a hashtag. You cannot use the word Bahrain hashtag in online social media without getting trolled uh, probably by people hired by the government of Bahrain or something. In Turkey though, do know that the government has support and those people are also online. So the real issue you have isn't the government buying fake accounts. The real issue is you have a polarized discussion and this polarized discussion, what you can do is you can spam somebody's mentions. Like you can constantly mention them, but there are ways users can deal with it. So the fake social media matters to the degree that you're not actually looking at people, you're just looking at data. It looks like a big deal. In my experience of the whole thing, and I get you know spam bots spamming me, and in my experience of what happens to most people, unless you're one of the most prominent people in getting your mentions spam for an ordinary person, they're invisible, they don't really matter. They only show up in your big data. That's kind of my take on. Two very quick points to add on that. I mean, I think the hiring of people to do publicizing tweets, and there's a difference between hiring people and I think creating bots to do things. It is only the tip of the iceberg, right? There's, there's a much larger question, which is how regimes respond to this, right? Yes. And this is an ongoing cat and mouse game as one side develops, the other side develops, and goes back and forth. Just to mention sort of a couple other things, right, that are possible, right? So one sense, on the other example, and you should see work by Gary King and Jen Pan and Molly Roberts on China and what China is doing with censorship. I mean, there are, you know, this is just about huge things about taking systematically taking huge amounts of content off of the, off of the internet. The other thing that we've wondered about that's potentially even more insidious about this is that as network science develops, the kind of thing Dean was telling us about the bridges, right, will regimes go after people based on where they are in networks? Right. right? If you want to take down sure. social media networks, sure. um, if you have to decide whom you're going to target, whom you're going to arrest, right, like when you arrest a blogger or something like that, which we've seen around the world, this is not something that doesn't happen, right, will the ongoing development of better understanding of where people are in networks, will that lead to regimes trying to take out, right, we've seen there, there's huge costs to trying to take out Well, Will, will Golden's case, that backfired profoundly. Absolutely, absolutely, and all this stuff, I think, is cat and mouse and it's evolving, and what we tell you today, three months from now there may be other things. But I do think, you know, we know there are costs to regimes to trying to take down the internet entirely. That doesn't seem to work out. So is there going to be sort of more selective uh, ways of doing this in the future? Uh, I think is an interesting question. But I think the question of how regimes respond is really important. Just to say, what they usually do is what I'm seeing in a lot of sort of authoritarian contexts is they're not taking the highest profile people because that also creates international media. There's, I'm seeing second level people who are actually crucial being targeted more by regimes than the most high profile because because their high profile works both ways. They get external attention, Western media. But if you're like the mid-level person, you don't get that protection, but you are visible to the regimes. I think they're most vulnerable there. 
extremely brief intervention. I just want to add by saying that in the case of Egypt, the, the government slash regime um, has often, or at least in, in the current circumstance, decided that rather than actually mobilize recruits uh, or, or pay recruits to do this kind of work, what they did was they, they activated what is otherwise described as the couch party, <laughs> you know, has been kind of, a, and they do so by, by uh, magnifying the messages from Twitter and Facebook of prominent activists or revolutionaries or on or conversely of Islamists to say, well, look, look who's dominating the social media sphere. Come on. Uh, do you want to come in? You know, enter enter the playing field. Enter. And what and what that does is it, it all of a sudden transforms the the demographics of the social media discussion. And in doing so, they recruit without necessarily having to deal with the the paper trail or the track or or to cover up their footprints. Let me let me do the pairs again. Um, we'll do two questions, two questions, and then we'll wrap up. But why don't we do all of them? Mine's quick for Professor Tucker. I'm Jim Bullock. I'm an adjunct at GW. Uh, some of my students, international students, have made presentations on other platforms. There's a there's a Facebook-like platform in Moscow. There's a, another one in China. And my question to you is, did those non, because we've talked about Facebook and Twitter today, but have those non-Facebook Twitter platforms figured? And then getting back to your comment about how the algorithms are going to begin to be manipulable and, you know, is, is these, are these alternate platforms an issue? Okay. okay. All, one, alternate platforms. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Faribo Parsa, George Mason University Center for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. My uh, question is, was also about uh, the regime's response, and I want to uh, bring the uh, Iranian case. Uh, more than uh, half of Iranian are online, and uh, they are very active in uh, Twitter and Facebook. Actually, Iran is the, is the number is the biggest in the entire Middle East. But because of uh, many of uh, Twitter uh, uh, people who uh, so had tweeted against the regime and they have been arrested, what has happened is self-censorship. So they are on Twitter, they are on Facebook, but it's not safe to... Uh, uh, shares uh, their ideas and opinions. So what do you say about so some very optimistic uh, b picture of uh, social media? It became so just uh, scrub. Thank you. Okay, let's keep going. Sure. Hi, I'm Matthew Lackenbach with Legacy International. And I think it's been an extremely inter interesting discussion on so many levels. My question specifically is regarding um, the use of these technologies in building bridges and um, their value in, in making connections and fostering dialogue and, and, and uh, peace as opposed to maybe the opposite pole, which is more revolution and um, organizing against something as opposed to building those ties. But I'm wondering if you can comment on that, if there are any markers to look for or guideposts that would um, suggest the value of these tools in promoting peaceful resolution of conflict. Uh, my question is for you, Mr. Uh, Iskander. It seems to me that both Egypt and uh, China, which, you know, thank you for mentioning that, um, are uh, countries with uh, large populations and significant rural populations in particular uh, that both also have governments with authoritarian tendencies. Um, and I really uh, liked what you said about how uh, how there, you need to go back to a lot of traditional ways of getting out the vote, so to speak. Um, and so I'd like to hear what lessons you think that Egypt might have to offer to uh, you know, Chinese dissidents uh, and ordinary citizens. So we have alternate platforms, self-censorship, uh, technology to build more bridgers, and to a, a better organizing tool. Who wants to? Okay. Um, I'm going to start at the, at the bottom with the, with the question on uh, on Egypt and, and what can be learned. Um, I think the you know the the one one can talk about Egypt in the context of, of being sort of a, a, a newly uh, politicized uh, country where uh, political participation not only in the in the context of uh, contributing at the ballot box but also basic political expression is something that didn't exist prior. Um, I think you know the the, the lessons learned are, are the lessons of January 25th, what existed there, the use of the social media to create sort of a parallel sp uh, sphere uh, to circumvent, uh, you know, institutions of power and surveillance and monitoring and what have you. Um, today, you know, we're, we're past that point. We're, we're at the point where, um, 
where um, political participation is is sort of a, a tidal wave, uh, is a really significant tidal wave that is impossible to, to silence. I mean, even when the government has uh, sort of an ax to grind with particular political players, uh, it, it, it can only do so with, uh, with a certain degree of efficacy, uh, beyond which, I mean, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is demonized and, and is now uh, listed as a terrorist organization, uh, they continue to protest literally every other day or every day, uh, and uh, with, you know, dwindling numbers, but still sizable enough that it's impossible to completely silence. Uh, and that, of course, is a realization on the part of the institutions of the state that there's nothing they can really do. Um, lessons learned for China, I mean, I, I know too little about China to really sort of make that uh, that leap of judgment, but I think um, to a large extent it, it's the problem is uh, is, a, is, a, is a capacity problem uh, in, in China, or it appears to me to be a capacity problem in China. And also the ability of the state to really sort of subsume political discourse uh, online uh, and, uh, and, and, and really sort of um, circumvent any attempt to, uh, to, to express dissent. But nevertheless, I think what's interesting in China uh, is that dissent is manifesting in these really sort of small, interstitial, interesting ways, akin to what I described earlier in the form of, of humor. Um, so what may not appear to be sort of a, a, a massive critique of the institutions of the state or the Communist Party's management uh, of, of affairs um, can um, can sometimes lead us to believe that there's nothing really going on. Where, whereas, arguably, I think um, uh, the 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 extent to which um, social media penetration in China is increasing, it provides a significant platform for these dialogues and these discussions to happen. And I would go back to what what um, what Zainab said on the issue of symbolism. I mean, what appears to be like a very very small negligible expression, uh, you know, on, online by not necessarily even an, an activist, but an ordinary person who acts as a node or as part of a significant cluster uh, can be much more dissenting and much more sort of complicated and, and embedded in meaning than, uh, than, let's say, a call to protest on January 25th where everybody says we're going to remove the government. Um, so, so I think we can, we can benefit from these, uh, these minor nuances as opposed to imagining uh, something so substantial, which I I think was a little bit romanticized to begin with. Uh, that we can we can look at the sort of the microscopic as opposed to the macroscopic view. So there's one thing. There's great amount of platform politics. We now have algorithms as political players, which really we need to sort of dive into. Right? What Facebook news feed shows you, how trending topics is calculated, who gets in where, who doesn't are of incredible consequence. And that's one of the ways governments are trying to intervene, right? Trying to control the platforms. There's a lot of contention over that in Turkey. Who gets in, let into China is a big deal. I mean, so that's, I think there's a new kind of study of algorithms as political players, platforms as political players. The, uh, in Turkey, it's Facebook and Twitter, not really alternative sites right now. It just depends on where you are on the planet, uh, how that plays out. In terms of uh, bridges and unity, I have to say, I mean, social media is interesting. It's an amplifier for sure. So it can amplify many things on the ground. It can amplify polarization. It can amplify dehumanization. It can create waves or vortex of polarization where people are increasingly, instead of coming together, sort of able to do this because it changes visibility. A comment that might have been an offhand comment, an ethnic slur that might have been just said in the quiet can now be visible to larger audiences which can drive these dynamics of polarization. It can also unite our, you know, here are 17 things that will restore your faith in humanity listicles, but that's kind of, you know, things that we like clicking on that make us feel good. It can do both of those things at the same time. So, I mean, a lot of this, does it do X, does it do Y? I keep saying yes. I mean, it's a more and more uh, situation where the humanity, it, it's probably happening at the same time. Low-level dialogue between people who are politically otherwise on different parts of the spectrum. What you said earlier, I think it's very important that as we connect person to person, since people are complex, we get more and more diverse views that we otherwise wouldn't have. And it sometimes flares up during the Wisconsin Union uh, conflict. Um, Facebook was a mess if you lived in that state because families were fractured along the politics. So 
in the old web where it was information driven, I think it was easier to be filtered by topic. You just went to people like you. Whereas right now, because you're connecting to person to person, those people are a lot more complex than just, you know, if you believe in this, you also believe in that. You know, there are people who are, you know, say, in, in any case, there are people who can be in, in anticipated places. The um, China example is fascinating. China, uh, Gary King's research is a great example of a lot of the things that you mentioned. The ch idea that China's politics is not impacted by social media just because China censors in certain ways is nonsense. Obviously, it's had a huge impact. You know, people, if they petition the emperor, like they, you know, they kind of use social media to petition the emperor in a lot of rural places, the way that it used to happen in the Middle, uh, a, you know, middle Ages, because it's a way of getting to power to say, this is what we don't like. And Gary King's uh, lab shows that that stuff doesn't get censored. That's actually Chinese government is responsive. You see the similar dynamics in Singapore. A lot of authoritarian governments are becoming more attuned to their citizens in ways that are legitimately viewed as participatory, but that are not voting. And you know, it's complex what that does to the legitimacy of a government. And maybe, since we don't have open surveys in China, we don't know, but it may well be that there's large numbers of people in China or places like Singapore that may prefer this slower, gradual political shift then because they're looking at the rest of the world and they're seeing turmoil. So I think it's quite complex It's in its impacts and no either or, no online or offline, no this or that. Let's look at all the dynamics in their totality. Okay, uh, very quickly. Um, on the alternate platforms and on the question of being afraid of being on social media, I actually think these two are related, right? Like, we. If you're gonna study this thing, I think you have to, on the one hand, be very careful because there are, and it's good to hang out with like 19 year olds and 18 year olds because there are new platforms sprouting out all the time and watching how people, I mean, did anybody, how many of you knew in this room that 450 million people were using WhatsApp? I mean, like that's a large number of people, right? Like six months ago, Tumblr was the new big thing. Instagram, you know, I'm not even sure where Tumblr is right now. So there's a limit to kind of as a scholar what you can study in this regard. I think for the moment we're fortunate in the sense that a lot of traffic is, is coming to Facebook and to Twitter. And I think in Russia, you had to be very careful because there was a lot going on with Contact Day. I, I think it's more migrating to Facebook now more and more. Um, we uh, we would like to look at the, we will eventually look at the Contact Day uh, um, traffic in Ukraine as well. And, and I think the, you know, there's two ways to think about this. One is that you get an incomplete part of the story if you look at different, uh, if you only look at certain platforms. And I think with all of this stuff, the key question we always have to ask ourselves is how biased is our sample? And we, the normal way that we think about bias is how representative uh, is it of the general population? But the thing about multiple platforms leads us to remember we also have to ask that question about even how biased is it of the, of the internet population and the digital population. And there will be some cases in some countries where you'll miss crucial demographics by not looking at platform X. But I think the more interesting thing is the sort of strategic sense of it, right? Like, is, here's the question in Ukraine, right? Is the contact day where you're going to find more of the answer to the previous question of pro Yanukovych sentiment. I have no idea. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Um, so I think those, that's, but, but it's also the answer to the fear and the afraid question, right? Like, there's constantly new platforms being generated, right? And that is part of the way, and, and Zainab was talking before about having, or someone was saying before, about having multiple personalities online. I mean, it's, you go to one platform to, for your parents to see you. You go to another platform for your friends to see you. There may be another platform that you end up going in places to be, for, to be more revolutionary. The bigger point here, I think, on this question of fear of being on these platforms is that for me, what's motivated me and why I got interested in this in the very beginning, uh, in addition to the reasons that I mentioned before, uh, I was really interested in the question of how the effects, so the big picture theoretical question is, how does social media affect political participation? For me, the two big sort of interactive things here is how does it vary across more and less open societies? And how does it vary across higher and lower cost levels of uh, political action? And I think that this is you're going to get, to think that there's going to be a one-size-fits-all answer to social media and political participation is misguided for precisely the reasons that you're, that you're identifying uh, here as well. Well, my role is to thank uh, Adil Iskandar, uh, Joshua Tucker, Zainab Tufeki for a wonderful panel, and then turn the platform back over to Sheldon.
for hosting us today. Well, thank you. Uh, it has been a rich and full morning um, on what's clearly a continuing, complex, unfolding story. And we've got a lot of folks to thank for that. First and foremost, our moderator, PJ Crowley, and six outstanding panelists today. So. Second, I, I want to make sure to thank the uh, USIP and the GW uh, staff that have really put today's meeting together. Anand Varghese right here and his teammate Julie behind him and Lola, where's Lola in the room? Um, I don't see Lola, but Lola from GW was also invaluable. Our AV guy, Steve, back there, and the meetings folks, Jamie is gone, but thank you all very, very much for helping um, take this, pu pull this together. Um, and. Also, I really want to thank that questioner who stood up and said, let's talk a little bit about the peace building application <laughs> of social media. I just came from a fascinating meeting where Twitter, it's interesting to see the social media companies themselves doing the analysis. And a fellow from Twitter said they had done an analysis of what looked like a, um, a, a onslaught of hate speech online when, if you recall, an Indian American won the Miss America contest. And what was most interesting is very quickly, the number of tweets that, to your point, Zainab, about amplification, the number of tweets that amplified how racist that comment was, how out of line it was and inappropriate, and it swarmed the negative, and in fact, within 48 hours, that voice was completely drowned out. So there is no question this cuts in multiple ways, and that's exactly why we have this series. Finally, my father was a school teacher. He used to say the key to a really good meeting is that the speakers deliver interesting information. The audience listens carefully and both finish their jobs at the same time. And I think that we met his bar, so thank you all very much, and we look forward to continuing this conversation in the future.